database of people who are requesting the assistance. Um, and the other portion of this is we'll really encourage people to sign up through August and September. We're getting a little bit of a late jump here. Uh, but our intention is, is to have this really promoted throughout the summer and then uh, encourage people to have everything turned in by September. That way we can have some, some people in place prior to the first snowstorm, which really can happen, you know, is, is even late September, early October. Um, as uh, forms are dropped off, um, we'll create the database, and our intention is, is that as we hear of a predicted storm, we can email people who are going to be in need of assistance as well as the volunteers just a friendly reminder that says, hey, let's maybe be proactive and do some coordination in advance. Um, so pretty, pretty straightforward, simple, simple pro, uh, process. We're really used to the volume of paperwork because we do so many program registrations that we've got several methods that keep us kind of organized and we're really good at building databases and we have software that allows us to build databases as well as mass email. Um, so we're pretty comfortable with, with receiving paperwork in and um, the front desk staff here at Town Hall has been great about helping with that as well. Now for those that are interested in volunteering, um, we'll have all of our opportunities, not just Snowbusters, but all the opportunities that we have in town listed on the town website, link through newsletters, digital activity guide. Um, we do have the capability of doing um, specific e-blasts. But as we were doing research, we, we had come across volunteermatch.org, um, which we had found to be a great, almost keeper of the information. So uh, as we post volunteer opportunities through our channels, we've had the ability to link straight to Volunteer Match. Um, and what Volunteer Match is, is it's a service that will allow you to search for opportunities by your interests, your location, um, date ranges for people who may need to do volunteer work within a certain time frame. Um, and what we really liked is it does allow you to search by location or keyword. Um, so as you would navigate to the town website or in a newsletter, click on the opportunity, it would, it would send you to what the home page would be. Um, we've even played around a little bit with having it linked directly to the volunteer opportunity itself. Um, the great thing about volunteer match is it creates an online form for you. We can link documents to it. Um, it also allows us to post the liability statement and have people accept the liability statement from the website. Um, Volunteer Match will keep the database for us, is, and is, uh, it'll also allow us to do a mass emailing. So we can type in predicted snow event, you know, plan for a Thursday. Please coordinate with your, you know, what do we call them, a, a snow buddy or your, your resident in need or your assistant in need. Volunteer Match allows us to do that. Um, we also like the fact that it was online. It may encourage uh, younger people, maybe high school age students or people who would be searching for volunteer opportunities online. We thought that using something like Volunteer Match would be a, a good opportunity to communicate. Um, we definitely feel like this program specific would be really great for youth and families to participate in together. Um, if there were a family that would want to help out, maybe they could cycle through, you know, each taking a turn depending on the length of the snow event. So we, we figured this was a great opportunity for kind of families to get involved. Uh, and again, uh, we feel confident that we could link the volunteer opportunities through the website and all of our various channels pretty easy using Volunteer Match. In terms of bringing it all together, um, staff will take kind of the two database and we'll do the upfront communication between the two. So say we've got somebody who's in needing assistance and we've got a handful of volunteers. Based on the basic information provided on the forms, we would do the upfront communication and introduction between the two parties. And then through you know either email exchanges or phone exchanges, let them know that as storms are coming, that it's now their responsibility to kind of coordinate together on times that work better. Um, maybe it's beneficial that snow get removed first thing in the morning prior to somebody needing to go to work. 
some of those kind of things. So staff's initial role will be really to kind of bring the two parties together. Um, we do ask that uh, the snowbuster volunteer for the entire season to avoid kind of the, well, I can do it in September, but I can't maybe do it in January or February. Um, using September as kind of the, the calendar rollover. Um, again, the staff will be able to initiate reminder emails prior to a predicted snow event so that the volunteer and the recipient can coordinate directly. Um, at, with kind of our limited staff capacity, removes us from doing the constant back and forth by email or phone and puts kind of the coordination back between the two parties. Um, and we also wanted to kind of make it known that participating in the program doesn't necessarily guarantee that a volunteer will always be available, um, that we will do our best to make that kind of coordination. Um, but after that initial communication, it is on the, it's the individual's responsibility to kind of communicate together and build that re relationship together. Um, and if a volunteer is not available or does not complete the service, staff is not responsible for finding a replacement. Um, Though if the database were there and there were people looking for service work, I think we'd be able to handle that. But it, uh, it's not something that would be required for staff to do, nor would it be uh, put upon staff to actually go out and remove the snow. Um, so that's a little bit about just kind of how we will work to bring it all together. Um, again, in, in researching this, we. Had, we had started to come across um, almost kind of the do's and don'ts of how a program like this works and, and the specifics on what you do and, and what you wouldn't do. So we had, we had put together just some brief lists of, of points that we'll communicate to both the volunteer and the recipient. Um, and we felt that it was important uh, that people not expect that a volunteer would provide services other than snow removal specific to this program. Um, we didn't want people to expect that a snow buster would remove snow other than the, on the sidewalks for the adjoining properties. Though if they wanted to go that next step and do a driveway or do the walkway to the house, they then could kind of coordinate that on, on their own. This was specific to making sure that the drive or the uh, walkway in front of the property was maintained. Um, we also wanted to to let people know not to expect the service if if it's likely that the snow is going to melt that afternoon. You know, if we get something two or three inches, kind of in a mid morning, but we're expecting warm weather in the afternoon. Um, to to not really expect that somebody's going to come right out uh, and move that snow for you. And then we, we just don't encourage um, that anybody offer payment for this service. It really is uh, a volunteer um, opportunity for the community. And then um, obviously we, we don't um, recommend anybody inviting anybody into the house. Uh, that was as we were researching through this, was made fairly clear throughout the process that you know let's let's stick to what the program is. We don't recommend that a volunteer um, accept coming into the house and we don't um, want to encourage a recipient to, uh, to invite somebody into the house. And then just to kind of reiterate, we wouldn't want the volunteer to accept payment or tips for the service. Um, we do expect that they remove the snow from the sidewalk of the recipient's house. Uh, they're not obligated to shovel the driveway. We've, if, if that arrangement was to be made, that is fine. We do ask that the snow be removed within 24 hours after a snow event. And again, just reiterating, uh, entering a recipient's home is just not something that the tent would recommend at all. So that in a, a brief, in a nutshell, is the, the framework for the Snow Busters program. All right, thanks. Questions? Lisa? Does that um, volunteermatch.com or whatever it is, um, does that provide the option for the town to provide like points for people for do good points and then they get you know anything? No, not that I know of off the, the top of my head. I will say that we haven't explored those kind of functions within the software. It's something that I, I think we could look into. I've just heard about some towns in the region trying to recognize civic contributions that way. 
Sarah? Um, is this working? Okay. Um, I kind of wanted to find out, um, is there, does the program delineate between um, different types of ways to volunteer, like example, um, a category of projects that you might want to be interested in, say you're interested in um, trails and you want to, you know, do trail management or whatever it is, or you're interested in, um, you know, working in the a senior capacity. Um, does it have like a degree of difficulty, easy, hard? Um, the the kind of fun thing, thing about volunteer match is we, we put in as much information in the description as, as we would choose. So um, we, can, we can type in all the keywords that somebody might query, whether it's uh, events, trails, you know, keep it clean, mm -hmm. creek cleanups. We can predetermine that um, through the search and then in the description, we can definitely say strenuous, um, light, things like that. And that would be something that, that you know, staff would predetermine in the description. Okay. And um, I was also going to kind of like, a, I guess you would call it a cafeteria menu where you also have an age limit, say, you know, you and your family would like to do a um, volunteer program where it's kids eight and under, you know what I mean, where you, you're able to volunteer based on the criteria that you might need. I'd have to look into it a little bit further on what the search parameters were. Um, I know you get, uh, I want to say you get two, two to three hundred words that you can basically upload or type into that. I don't know if Volunteer Match has a, an age as a, as a filter, but it's something that I think we can, if not write into the language that we could probably um, enhance or change descriptions. Um, and I do know that, that if it were a youth or a family opportunity, um, that you can, you can build that into the search. So if somebody went to it or we posted family volunteer opportunity, um, that that would populate itself or be a selection in volunteer match. So when you first go to the website, mm -hmm. what do you see? Do you see the opportunities that Superior has for volunteer? Um, it would link directly to a page that says search for volunteer opportunities. And what we've, we've done several tests, and in, in our descriptions we'll say search snowbusters. And if you populate in there snowbusters, hit search, it'll bring itself up. Um, we've had several people, even just with kind of the dummy listing that we've had out there, and believe, believe it or not, we've had five or six people who have already said, hey, when the snow's coming, let us know. Just off of our kind of dummy account, they were people who were searching just by zip code. Um, so log on, go to the main page, big button that says search for opportunity, search for opportunity, and then it'll, it'll ask location, keywords, phrase, that kind of thing. And we, we fully anticipate that as we promote the programs, there will almost like the activity guide where we search for snowbusters, encouraging people to type that into the field. And then it does kind of self-populate with the opportunity. Um, so would this help those that have no idea what they're searching to volunteer to do? Um, yes. I just did a search on it uh, earlier. In Superior, Colorado, as location, they found 960 volunteer opportunities. But that's also including Denver. Yeah. So okay. um, that I had kind of the same question along that line. If if we plan on doing more volunteer mm -hmm. efforts besides just snowbusters, is there other things that we would do? Is that why yeah. we chose this service to do that? We we liked it because it was broad enough that it could bike parks and Fourth of July and Chili Fest and mm -hmm. creek cleanups and you know uh, National Day of Service if we were to do building restoration. This will allow you to upload, once your organization is approved, it will allow you to upload as many volunteer opportunities as, as you have. Um, there were several municipalities that were using it that you know, recommended. Um, we 
like the, the ability to, to upload the liability waiver um, and do some of that customization um, and make and it searchable. Is this um, fee for service or is this free? It, um, I want to say that we were on the free version now. I'd have to check with Katie. I think like anything, it'll allow you to really beef it up and maybe even allow pictures and, and logos, but I think the fee was, was minimal. Um, but I want to say the listing now is on the free, the free account. We did have to go through an approval process okay. where uh, Volunteer Match kind of checked us out as an organization based upon what opportunities we may have. Um, and then there is a, a bit of a window when we upload information. I think, um, from what I understand, it does go through an approval process on there, and so you're not posting things that shouldn't be on there. So you can expand. Yeah, and we right now we could list, you know, every volunteer opportunity that we've done in the past year. We found several organizations that had, I mean, 20, 30 different opportunities. So it's it's got the ability to handle quite a bit. Um, great idea. Um, really appreciate you guys doing this and having it up and running for this winter. How do we intend both ways to educate the, muni the community broadly, both the volunteers and the people who hope to get assistance? I, I think for us, unfortunately, we're a little bit late in the game. Um, but really with our kind of e-blasts and the town newsletter, and, and we'd really like to utilize that um, digital recreation guide because it is linkable. Um, we've chatted with uh, putting things on channel 8 um, and using some of the channel 8 capabilities, but really promoting it like we would any of our other opportunities, making sure it's in e-blasts, um, highlighting it, you know, in the, we do a seasonal pros newsletter. Um, Have you considered um, actually sending a letter or stopping by Monarch's uh, counseling office? I think they used to have actually a hard bulletin board you pin things on, but they're and their key club, their key club is all volunteer oriented, so they can serve as the so interface there. The honor society. What, Joe? I said the honor society probably is too. Right, and then uh, second question. Um, I understand that if the volunteer cannot do it, the recipient of the assistance is on his or her own. Is it possible to have a group of backups, actually people who volunteer to be the occasional backup, so that if your volunteer can't do it during the holidays, maybe that set of volunteers with their phone numbers can be there in the person has to call yeah. those phone numbers. And, and something I, I think I should, may have just glanced over is that um, we, had, we had put in there, if unable to, to provide the service, um, we would ask that the snow buster, the volunteer snow buster, initially try to find that replacement. Um, but I, I anticipate, and maybe this is optimistically, that I think we'll, we may have more volunteers than people actually requesting the service mm -hmm. and we've got a number of great service groups um, the high schools helped us out at fourth of july and chili fest the scouts have helped us out most things will call and helped us out and and those are groups that i think this opportunity is great for mm -hmm. um, we feel pretty comfortable that if, if we were to say that you know there was a shortage we ran into that this last 4th of July, where the firefighters who normally volunteer were obviously unable to volunteer. It took a couple of emails, and before you know it, we had more volunteers than we know what we can do with. And then so, lastly, um, I would anticipate that there are going to be those occasions when some recipient of assistance is unhappy with their volunteer and would request a replacement volunteer. So how are you um, planning to handle that? I think if the database of people is available, it would be fairly easy for us to, to find a replacement. The other thing that we had, had try to think about is logistically how would this work um, if we could get a fair number of kids involved. Um, and really through, just what you suggested, hopefully building a base of volunteers where it would be more of a, I don't want to say pick and choose, but 
having the opportunity to say, well, maybe this isn't going to work out. And, and hopefully taking the volunteer who's obviously trying to do something good, place them somewhere where they're still needed and then fill that role. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful that we'll have that database to pull from. Okay. Um, but the, the specific to kids, trying to pair people in areas where a kid can safely walk or a couple of kids can safely walk without having to, you know, in the snow cross intersections is something that we, we've definitely chatted about. So um, what, uh, what criteria did you go through to determine um, how much of the property that these or residents are asking for snow removal. Why did you choose the sidewalk? We stayed uh, pretty specific to what the town ordinance was. Uh -huh. um, okay. And it was basically, it was on. I kind of figured that was it. Yeah, I just and, to hear it. And then we, we also kind of stuck to the, we thought two inches of snow would be kind of a good trigger point for us. So if we saw a predicted snow event that was going to be two inches, we thought that that would maybe be a good trigger point for us to say, okay, let's communicate to both sides, let them know that something predicted is coming, maybe going to be more than two inches, and have some communication to organize it amongst themselves. So you mentioned that there's a few people that are already uh, signing up uh, to be the recipient of that, and are any of them mentioning that they would like um, snow removal through their uh, sidewalk to their front porch as well as their driveway? You know, um, we haven't. There's, there's been one person who's mentioned that they'd be interested in having the assistance. Um, what we did is we created, just to get volunteer match, we created uh, the opportunity and within, I would say, a couple weeks of us posting the opportunity, we've had people from Superior as well as Broomfield and Boulder who have responded to just the opportunity. We haven't really publicized it um, for people who may need assistance. Um, so I haven't seen anything yet. Um, I, wonder, I, think it'll, I, I think it's likely to occur. I wonder if the recipient might be um, wanting or asking to get a volunteer that is willing to do the whole kit and caboodle. And uh, is that something that they're, something that they can request? Or is that kind of something that we're not going to deal with? Yeah, that's something they, they would coordinate on their own. So say they got a volunteer that isn't willing to do that, but there's another volunteer they know out there that's willing to, is that something that they can request and ask for assistance? Do we have that capability? You know, I, would, I would think so. I would think so. I, I would. Um, Is there flexibility, in other words? I, there's definitely flexibility. Um, I would. I think we would also want to make sure that the person who was offered to volunteer still has an opportunity to do so. But I, I, I think it is likely that um, that people will begin to say, well, if I'm if I'm here to do the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and and that person's needing the driveway, I think. I think it's likely that it will occur. Um, we wanted to make it really narrow to, for what our focus was, knowing that there was going to be some, obviously, relationship building on both sides, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Um, it, it may turn into, you know, shoveling up towards the front door. But, so. Well, let's see, the, to stay on track, any other uh, yeah. questions? Do we have any idea how many people would participate in this program that would need this type of service available to them? Or can we identify people that who might? Um, we've got some basic statistics that we kind of collect in our, our recreation software. Um, so we've done some looking at age ranges, but um, I think this will be an opportunity that we initially throw out there mm -hmm. and try to do our best to educate the community on and let people know that the, the service is available. Um, yeah, if there's a way we could identify individuals in the community 65 and older and I can't imagine it's that many and then actually reach out to them and say hey, we have this service available if you know of anybody that would need something like this um, and then if I were a volunteer and wanted to participate um, 
I go to the website, put in Superior, Colorado, or Snowbusters, will it give me a map of all the homes? Show me a map where they are. So if there's something on Eaton Circle, and I live on Eaton Circle, that's the one I'm going to go to. Um, the map will show you our, the town hall location. Um, it's something that I think if staff kind of does that coordination, yeah. that, again, thinking about kids walking or families walking. Exactly. I'm thinking um, of the, the map. The map in volunteermatch.com would only show uh, the address here because that's the address we okay. use. I don't, I don't believe it's got the capability to narrow it in that specific. Um, so how does the volunteer then know where they at, where the place they're going to, and the contact information and all of that? That'll be that communication piece okay. that the town facilitates. When we do the initial kind of pairing column A with column B, um, we'll, we'll make those initial communications and um, you know provide basics, phone number, name, address. Okay. We do want to we, we do want to be sensitive to not not posting too much out right. there where we could run into some issues of. Here's a map of where people are infirm or on vacation. Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the baby, you know, that, that, very, that very topic came up with people who may be gone for a yeah. certain amount of time. And that's when we decided it, it made a little more sense to have staff kind of be the keeper right. of the information. Okay. I yeah, think about some of the Boy Scouts that don't drive yet but would be able to do this kind of thing. Um, that they need to know before they volunteer if it's going to be across Superior or if it's going to be down the street. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other uh, questions? Thanks so much. I think it's going to be a great program. I, uh, do you have a, uh, I, always in terms of, I'm always interested in metrics, can you to have a, a baseline that you want to, a target threshold you want to get to and a stretch goal that you want to get to in terms of the number of people that would be served? Um, in terms of number of people that wanted to be or would want to be served, I, I think realistically if, if we identify 20 people, I would be ecstatic. I think realistically, having started programs and volunteer opportunities before, I think this year, five to 10, as kind of people who either run across it in the newsletter or find it here at Town Hall or who are maybe seeing this presentation. Um, but a lot like our, our other volunteer opportunities, they, they have that snowball effect. And, and I, I think we're pretty optimistic that it, that it would take off. Our, our initial thought is that um, we've had a lot of success finding volunteers, mm -hmm. so the potential of having more volunteers up front than people who are actually requesting the service is something that we're yeah. trying to prepare for. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, but uh, we need to move on then to the presentations on the weed and pest management. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Martin Tove this morning introduced to the board um, and just we plan on giving an update to the board on what our current practices can happen and continue to be with regard to weed pest management um, for our parks and open spaces. And then answer any questions. Thank you, Matt. So um, I'll get things started. I did wanted to just you know reiterate uh, you know, what the town manager started with. We wanted to schedule some time in a work session you know, to share some information about something that's a fairly complex subject. I mean, the idea of using um, synthetic chemicals versus organic compounds to bind feed less than pests and weeds uh, is, is a topic that um, is one that staff takes very seriously and we want to be able to spend some time sharing where uh, we're coming from with what, with what the town program is comprised of. Now, we don't have a formal presentation we wanted to go through. We included a, uh, a memo uh, in response to a request that I think came up a couple of months ago. Uh, there was some CNC dialogue and a few citizens. I talk to citizens every year have questions about our uh, our week past application program, but there have been some considerable dialogue, and I think there have been some a number of citizens that have called my office, and maybe called a number of folks uh, up behind your desk and also the manager's office who wanted to just hear a little bit about more what, what our program is. Um, so we wanted to just give you the opportunity to hear about uh, some of the details. Uh, the, uh, the memo had a little bit more of a breakdown of what some of the costs are and what some of the chemicals are that are used and a little bit about why, um, but we'd like to try and take the opportunity to fill some of the blanks of what we do. There's not a recommendation in the middle. Um, staff's not recommending a change to the town's program or an increase to the town's budget or to do anything different um, other than what you received as your preliminary, but it's a little last week. 
Um, but we did want to share with, uh, any information we can and also share what, we, what we've learned from the experience of some of the other folks uh, who deal with this throughout the uh, region and then also um, just try to answer questions about what the uh, next step might look like. So with us tonight we have um, Stacy Parcell from Cocal Landscape and also um, Paulus Madrano from Cocal Landscape and then the town's Parks Open Space Superintendent, Ellen McBeth, will get things started describing a little bit about the detail of our program. If you have any questions, we'll be after. Great. Thanks. Ellen, um, we do have a disease uh, integrated pest management program, which basically means we're trying to use the uh, least dangerous toxic method first. And then we go down the list and we um, do use um, some chemicals. Um, but the main chemicals used are glyphosate, which is Roundup, and 2,4-D. And it probably accounts for over 90% of the, the turf we, uh, that we control. So, um, Alan, can you repeat that? What was the name of that chemical? Glyphosate is Roundup. It's Roundup, no, okay. Glyphosate is Roundup, and now the patent is run out from Monsanto, so there's all different brands um, that's glyphosate, like Prosecutor and different things. Um, we don't use a lot of chemicals here as far as weed control. We can try drive around and see. We don't use a lot right now. So we've been trying to um, just use it when we have to. We do a lot of variation. Lot of uh, soil amendments, and this is a big town, so we try to be as safe as possible. We're open for any any alternatives that make sense, uh, that is approved and budgeted for. Um, so that's basically the, the gist of this uh, presentation. We have contacted several other communities, including Boulder, Denver, uh, Louisville, Durango. They've all tried organics, and gradually, after a year or two, they start using synthetics because the control's just not there. Um, as much as we'd like to think Boulder doesn't use glyphosate, they do. It's on their website. Um, they have an excellent reporting system, which uh, you might you know, need to look at, I'm sure. But, um, the, the entities I've contacted, they agree with our original estimate that the cost would be three to five times more if we go for an organic route. Okay. The organic route doesn't just include using corn gluten or a citrus based uh, post emergent. It includes building up the soil, you know, having compost to compost and sort of thing, very labor intensive. In our memo, um, we mentioned it take at least two years we change programs to an organic based program to see any, any real comparison. But after talking to uh, Stacy and Carlos, uh, they would think it'd be closer to three years. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a, a more decision how we want to go. I don't think the, the look will be the same. And I don't think, uh, I know it'll be more expensive than the but I'm open for any questions. Jesse Hansen, when you're going to treat for weeds, do you know, is it kind of around the same time every year, multiple times during the year, or is it random? You just start seeing a lot of weeds coming up, so then it's time to treat, or is it the first of April every year? In the past, um, most entities uh, did a lot of uh, pre emergence. We don't do much pre emergence here, spot spray, spot control. The 2,4-D controls a lot of weeds, and then the Roundup is a full spectrum. You know, it just kills everything. It's green and growing. It's got to be green and growing. So the weeds that come up in the turf grass are usually treated with some form of 2,4-D, which is Trimac or three-way. That's thing. There's a million different formulations. And do you have any idea when that's going to happen? Is it the same, about the same time every year that you do that? We do it in spring, fall, okay. and mid summer. Okay. Pre emergence, of course, you always put on in early spring, and, and the way they work is they produce a, a film on top 
the soil surface, the seed germinates, if it's that film dies, it just takes too much profit. And then when you spray that, how long do you have to stay off the, the grass? Or how long is it recommended? 24 hours. It's good bed. It okay. The flag, say. Yeah, one of the things that Boulder does differently is they have a hotline. And I believe a website that they announce when they're going to be spraying this right, stuff. That's their, uh, their pesticide application program. Yeah. So if there's a way that we can announce ahead of time that these certain areas are going to do that, I think that I might think solve some of the problems. Yeah, they, they post theirs on a Friday, what they're going to do the following week. And they list the product. That's where you can see um, uh, rodeo is used a lot by the world. Rodeo is glyphosate. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Lisa? Um, the the RCAC was interested in investigating what was going on with this and what, what the concerns were of the residents and all that. And I think one of the major things um, Chris has hit on, which was that um, they were really interested in hearing more information in advance about, about what was going to be sprayed and what the length of time they needed to stay off the property and that sort of thing was. I think the town's been pretty responsible about that pretty much immediately. So we, it was in our recommendations, but I think the town has already undertaken that kind of notification. Um, we heard that um, people that came forward from the residents also noted that citizens of towns can sign up on a state website to note that they're chemically sensitive. We were, thank you for following up on finding out how many people in, res in Superior were on that list, which turned out to be zero. So that was a concern that turned out to not be a, a major, major concern. It can be... It does take a doctor's permit to get on that. Yeah. And the doctor's permit to get on the uh, state um, sensitivity list, so that might... You've got to make that effort. To, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So thanks for investigating that. We, You have to be a certain level, either a landscaper or a town, I think, to investigate that. Not just anyone can look that sort of stuff up. So thank you for doing that for the... The committee was very concerned about that. Um, I think we were interested in hearing what other towns, they were interested in hearing what other towns did, and, and thank you for reporting on that. Um, and finally, the, the committee was interested in seeing possibly a pilot test of a, of a plot um, um, that would be done organic in a sort of parallel plot that would be just sort of normal and have, see how that worked in, in a two-year period. We don't know how expensive that would be. I think it would be something that would be interesting to consider in the budget discussion, and that's, I think, the, pretty much those are the recommendations of the RCAC. Okay, just, um, we need to examine the cost. And yeah. oh, we were pleased to see that the um, stuff that is being spread now is not sort of the high, highest toxicity or whatever, but rather <coughs> you mentioned classes that it, yeah, that it class, was. And class 1 is the most toxic. Class 2 yeah. is the next toxic. Both of those on the label. The label is everything in herbicide, pesticide use. Um, class one and class two on the label says danger poison. And class three products, which is what we use, most towns use, is caution. And basically, um, the government has determined that you know if it's applied right, the risk is minimal. So um, the next, the lowest one is no toxicity. So what's class four? Class four is no toxicity at all. Okay. And we use class three? Right. There's and not really any. Well, the point of gluten and citrus base would be in the class four. The right. what now? I'm sorry? So corn gluten is an organic. Okay. And uh, citrus based products are the post emergent. They're organics, and those would be a class four. Because my, my neighbor uses some wild concoction of like dish soap beer, I don't know what else he uses, and, uh, you know, it's nice and green, um, but I don't know. Um, I think the, the biggest issue is probably disseminating that. <laughs> um, and, and, right, and organic sure they can be dangerous, too, if they're not used right. So, um, so my other question is, how do we disseminate it, our uh, pesticides? Sorry, what? How do we apply it? Usually it's backpack sprayers, and they do have, a, they, uh, Cocal does use ATV with a small uh, 
five-gallon tank and a battery. Um, and then for the uh, when we get out in uh, native areas, um, there's quite a bit of driving to do. Sometimes they use a truck and a sprayer. We don't broadcast spray. Like we broadcast is where you see the big trucks going down and boom, sprayers behind them. Usually it's spot spray. But they're not trying to kill everything. So. And they don't want to use a lot of product either, you know, because it's expensive. And they're being exposed. I actually lived in a community that only allowed natural fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides. And uh, it actually was very interesting. And what I recall from it is the quality of the entire landscape was different. Um, when you, um, I, I think it, we should be, pre be prepared if we go totally with an all natural type of approach that things will look different, and I just want the community to be uh, prepared for that. You naturally have more weeds, you naturally have less green, um, and you just as a community become familiar with that. When you fertilize, it's much smellier when you fertilize, and what I recall is the level of mosquitoes were much, much higher. I mean, we just simply couldn't be outside after, you know, during dusk onward because there was um, no mosquito control. Um, because I think mosquitoes are largely controlled through synthetics, aren't they? Uh, can they be controlled? Anyway, so it, it, it is a different type of um, thing. And while that might be um, you know, the purest um, goal, it, it does make a difference. Just want to give the personal testimony there. It's just, just uh, to go. Lisa? Um, I think there were some residents on the um, CAC that were interested in going that direction, but I think the bulk of the residents were not interested, and there certainly wasn't the appetite on the committee um, or the council from what we could detect, detect either. Um, the recommendation is not to go organic from the RCAC. The recommendation is just to have a test, a potential small test pot, lot. Uh, when ProStack discussed this, and I wanted to see if Jim Payne wanted to come up and address this at all <coughs> on behalf of his committee. Jim Payne, Superior Resident, Chair of the Parks, Rec, Open Space, and Trails Advisory Committee. Um, we too uh, saw the and followed the um, the comments on the bulletin board, also known as the CAC. We I just we spent a lot of time on this. We spent um, addressed it in two meetings. A subgroup of us spent about an hour and a half with staff going over uh, what became this uh, staff report in, in great detail. And um, we were very impressed. I mean, it was, uh, uh, we thought they were, staff is, is doing this the right way, and that um, all factors considered in terms of effectiveness and uh, safety and um, economics, that they're on the right course. So ProStack unanimously um, passed a recommendation to stay the course. But we did suggest um, two things uh, that would be constructive. One would be, we would like to um, make recommendations to the board. I think we targeted this for November um, to uh, uh, come up with suggestions on uh, communicating spraying application times to um, residents. And um, and uh, if that's something you'd like to, s to see uh, addressed, we'd be happy to come back to you in November or by November with recommendations. And the other is we. We plan to put this on our annual agenda to have an update um, in early spring with staff uh, just to see what the latest developments are and if there are any changes in the technology or anything we should be looking at. Um, so we will make those two recommendations within ProStack. But uh, we're, we're very impressed with what the staff's doing. They're very supportive. Okay, thanks. Other questions? or? Uh, yeah, I was just at an open space uh, advisory committee meeting, and this actually wasn't on our agenda. And I think it would have been a great um, topic for the open space to discuss it, because we do have an open space management plan for all the open space um, parcels that we've acquired, and we have talked about that in the past, all but quite a long time ago. But um, I think that that could be an, a nice uh, 
I'll pass over to uh, Open Space to weigh in on that issue as well, if, if we could. Can't hurt. Okay. Anybody else? I think the only thing that I've noticed is that when swingles around spraying the trees, um, which is, a, I think, a difficult task to do just because the trees are so tall and how to apply the spray that it, there was a lot of drift when I noticed it. So I don't know if you just a conversation with them maybe might be helpful. Um, and I think um, what I've heard is that uh, during the budget discussion, not that we've signed on to anything, <laughs> that it would be helpful to have staff identify a plot that potentially could be uh, looked at for organic uh, pesticide control um, and with a cost. Um, and then we can decide whether or not we're going to proceed with that or not. That sounds fair. Okay. Anything Thanks. else? I think that means that we have a 10 minute break. <coughs> break. Start back up at 7.
<laughs> you were a special shoe when you played rugby? Similar to football? Different? Bookmarks are all screwed up now, Mr. Yeah, I don't know if it was the, there was an upgrade that then. Pretty good. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to call to order a board of trustees of the town of Superior for August 13th, 2012. And Phyllis, if you call the roll. Here. Mayor Andrew Buckle. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Elia DeVores. Trustees Joe Sorelli. Here. Chris Hansen. Here. Sandy Penny. Here. Lisa Skuma. Here. Debbie Williams. Here. Town Manager Matt Bagley. Here. Town Attorney Kendra Carberry. Here. Here. Great. Thanks. That brings us to item number three, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Trustee Skumas. To approve the agenda, second by Trustee Williams. Discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Brings us to reports. Aren't we spending money? Oh, never mind. Not on the agenda yet. Yeah. We will. Yes, yes. we will be spending money. Uh, uh, reports, questions, and issues. Anybody want to start tonight? Trustee Hansen? Um, I attended the uh, National Night Out last week, and uh, what a great event it was. Great weather. Lots of people showed up. Lots of good food. And uh, Deputy Valdez does a really nice job putting that together. And I think we're a very fortunate community to have the Sheriff's Department involved that we have here. So thank you very much to Sergeant Chamberlain and his staff. Um, today we went to Superior Elementary School for the Welcome Back to School Day and meet the teachers and the classrooms and all that. Um, and I saw the striping, the, the preparation work for the striping on Indiana. And I have some questions about how that's going to work. Um, so there's not going to be any left turn lanes coming from Rock Creek Parkway towards El Dorado. No. And yeah. that's going to create a huge problem because there's cars that turn into yeah, Superior sure. Elementary a lot. Um, and if they can't turn in, they're either going to have to drop kids off at the other end by Rock Creek Parkway or over at El Dorado. And if they want to turn in there, they're going to create big traffic jams. So I think we should look at that a little bit closer before we actually set that in stone. Well, school starts Wednesday. Right. So, um, the double yellow is mostly there. Yeah. yeah. They've gone forward. I don't know. Yeah, so they're not going to be able to turn in. Did you look at it? We've, um, we sh so we shared the diagram with the board, and then we shared it. With, <coughs> we want to get your feedback first, and then we shared it with the school district maintenance staff to see if they had any comments, and then to share it with uh, the principal of the school. And I don't think we got feedback from. The, well, the principal said she was happy to see it, and so was the school district maintenance staff. So, I, I think there was some misunderstanding there because the school maintenance staff that approved it basically went back to the principal and says, "Are you fine with this?" And Miss Iconoy's response is, "Yeah, this is the experts have gone out and told us this is the thing to do, so we're fine with it if they're, if they're doing it." Um, but it's a matter of, I mean, we can stripe it, however. We were just trying to help the school out. Agreed. She said she wanted more parking. We thought it made sense. People park there on the street during the school hours anyway. Uh, it creates traffic problems to begin with. Yeah. Um, so we uh, had the current um, paint removed last week, and uh, contractors out next tomorrow paint it, so it's done for school. So, however. Um. Well, I mean, if we proceed like we're going, it's, there's going to be problems come Wednesday morning. So, and, and the other thing is, I think the principal has shared these changes in her newsletter. I think she said she was going to do that. Okay. Um, so. Um, okay. Um, so is there any way we can revisit it before we actually put the lines down and, and prohibit people from turning in? I mean, the paint hasn't been put down yet, so. I, I assume that they're going to be a lot. I mean, there might not be a turn lane, but they're not going to stripe it that you can't turn left. Correct. Okay. It just backs up the traffic. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So, so we're going to have to slow down traffic, uh, especially during those times. Uh, and in the morning, we're 
can drop off and go after the pickup. Right. And, oh, and the, I saw a couple of sets of dotted lines coming along it on the, as you're going from, when the school's on your right, uh, yeah. <laughs> whichever direction uh, that is. Yeah. Okay, so if the school's on your right, the right that right-hand lane is two-thirds of the road, and there's, there are like several those dotted lines. Is that a, it looked like it was for bicycle lane in the middle? Uh, those are parking, those are parking spaces. There's it, parking spaces, really then a bike lane, and right. then the lane. Yeah. And then, and then the west side is, is the, the other one. With dark right. lines, I couldn't tell what was yeah. going to go on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Those are for the paint on Yeah. Where's the bike lane? On the outside of the park. Okay. Um, uh, I just. I mean, we have parking to get care of the bike lane usually outside. Is it appropriate for staff to go out tomorrow morning before the strikes go down? <laughs> bring the um, principal out so that she understands exactly what's going to happen and what some of these issues might be. Yeah. It seems to me one last check would be free. And uh, possibly then to have staff out there Wednesday morning to see what the net effect is. I mean, uh, can we monitor it once, oh, yeah. uh, once yeah, yeah. cars are yeah. actually there going back to school? It, but I can guarantee that we're going to have a lot of upset parents and also non-parents that travel that road that have to wait. Because right now there's a, a long enough wait when people are trying to turn in. You have one car there, oh, it's going to be a mess. I mean, it's a mess as it is. This is going to be a problem. So and I would suggest we come up with a different plan instead and of trying to. It wasn't clear in the diagram before <coughs> that we were getting rid of that turn line. Like well, I didn't, when we discussed it, I, did, I just brought up the point about the buses and it seemed like there was parking spaces where the buses go. I didn't think it was going forward so quickly. I thought we were going to discuss it some more. So um, it was brought up, though, yeah. that there was a concern about turning left. Sandy brought it up. So. And, the, yeah, the response, I think, was that the, it would slow traffic down for sure. Yeah. Um, but Where do the buses park and they what time do they get out. there? The buses have to pull out right there. So the buses are there in the morning and the uh, most morning and the definitely in the afternoon. So Chris, is your net net concern that the net impact of adding the parking sp spaces yeah. might be outweighed by the negative impact of absolutely okay. the, the reason this is happening if i understand correctly is because we implemented that program last year on certain days when there's lots of traffic going into the parking lot right. that allowed them to park on the street so those was dozen days or whatever it was we fixed that problem by doing this but we've, we're creating a problem every single day now so and i i had i met with the principal over the summer and we talked about <coughs> it and, um, uh, she seems supportive of the idea, so which is why we put uh, let's put the diagram to show uh, what we're going to do there, um, which I uh, gave to the board. Okay. Um, I like the idea of meeting again one time tomorrow morning, and I'd be happy to go out there and meet with Miss Iconoy and Alex and whoever else just to go over those concerns because I also do crossing guard duty there, and I see the traffic goes by in the afternoon, and it's going to be a problem. So, what would the board prefer to do? Uh, well, I think that my preference. I mean, I, I share the same concerns about the turning left, but I, I think, and quite frankly, I was happy with how everything was before. So, I, you know, uh, that being the case, I think it, uh, as a minimum, we'll need to monitor how the impact is on the new striping plan, um, and that if it doesn't work, then we'll have to reassess that. I'm not sure I'd try to now redesign something on the fly. I mean, assuming we could use black paint. I mean, that road's going to be reconstructed or repaved next year. Um, so I assume that we could do some black paint if it ever came to that point where it wasn't working. Is it is it possible that we at least speak to Ms. Eichen right tomorrow and see if she would prefer to go back with the original striping? Because if we're going to stripe, we can stripe either way we want. Right. 
go back to the original striping and then deal with the overflow parking some way. And I understand it's a burden on staff, but maybe there's something else we can do. Um, and thank you, by the way, for the sidewalk that's going in there. Um, but let's, can we talk to her first? And then if she says, no, let's go ahead and try it, then I'm all for it. Let's try it. Okay. Thanks. That's okay. it. Anything else? Justice Riley? Um, Justice Kamatz? Um, it's nice to be back. Um, uh, let's see. I think the only things I have to report are um, I held two coffee buzz meetings, and during one of them I had some folks come up to me who were very concerned about the divergent diamond, and they seemed to think that you know, late at night, unfamiliar people who are drunk or whatever <laughs> might have some difficulties and, and that might lead to crashes. I reassured them that, um, according to um, Trustee Williams' story, it made it look the, the um, roads looked like one-way streets that would be hard to hard to go wrong, and, and I figured we'd sign it enough, but not too much, so that people don't get distracted by all the signs. But I just want to let you know that that concern sits out there, and, and that's... Yeah, we, had, we heard some more types of concerns, and we put it in a roundabout at 88. Yeah. And Pardon. can I just comment that the reason I noted that was because their median was high enough where you couldn't see over it. So it felt like you were on your own one-way road, not that you were on the opposite side of the road. And that was a concern that, for me, um, if you were at night and had no idea that you're, you know, entering a completely new um, type of driving for the United States, you are now going to the opposite side of the road, uh, that it would be difficult for those having no clue um, and that the median needs to be high enough so that that's for me it's still an issue well I think you'll see tonight in the presentation I think it's I, I think it's high enough okay. but yeah okay. um, I want to thank Matt for keeping me in the loop during my absence and um, and I wanted to say how sorry I was to hear that we're losing Jay um, He's been a great person on the RCAC, and really, I think it would be hard to replace him. Yeah, yeah. He's what a always positive person. Yeah. Um, RCAC had a meeting Thursday. We worked on the um, information that you heard about earlier, and they also worked on, um, um, over the last two months, they put inserted some materials in the chamber drop for to let people know about some of the programs, and um, are planning the fall um, Zero escaping workshop for early October. We'll keep you posted on that. And um, so here's another question. Has Boulder always had a chili fest before ours that was as well advertised as they're doing right now? Uh, <laughs> it's I annoying. Don't know. <laughs> it seemed new to me. Uh, so Martin informs me that they've had one in the past, but it's not certified by the so if people can't qualify, move on to regionals and theirs, so, um, but yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the board. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Must okay. be a great idea, though. Guess yeah, you. I guess. <laughs> I have nothing. Trust you, We need to have a creek fest. What do you think? <laughs> Can we get a creek? And we have a creek. <laughs> Sorry. Sort of. Um, so... <laughs> There's going to be a Denver Regional Council of Governments meeting this Wednesday. That'll be um, fairly crucial for the U.S. 36 uh, corridor project that um, the entire corridor is working on. And this is phase two of the project. And um, they're asking for $15 million in federal money um, awarded through the Dr. Cog board. And... Uh, there's now seven options uh, and counting. I'm sure there's uh, several more that will uh, appear in what, how to fund with the remaining amount of money. It's close to 40 million, and uh, there's, I think, 75 million of projects. So someone's going to get cut, and some will be awarded uh, funds. And um, so anyway, I just want to uh, note that I will be voting accordingly to get that $15 million. 
Um, and I believe out of the seven options, five out of the seven award the 15 million to our corridor, which is very important. And this is not part of the fast tracks. This is, well, parts of it is part of the fast tracks, but this is not the rail piece. This is just what they call bus rapid transit. And it would not be what we would call true Cadillac BRT. Um, so uh, we definitely want to make sure that our quarter gets something, especially if we don't get rail. Uh, I think that's about it. Thank Great. Thanks, Trustee Pennington. Um, I believe most of us attended, uh, wasn't it July 30th, the um, Joint uh, Planning Commission Town Board uh, meeting on the comp plan. Those things are always very valuable so we can uh, get the input of our planning commissioners on how to build out or, or not the rest of this um, town. Um, I wanted to uh, sort of ad ad address an advisory committee sort of issue. I, I received a phone call, and Matt, you're totally aware of this, um, for somebody trying to sign up for, uh, apply for OSAC. And um, am I correct, you cannot submit an electronic application? No, currently we do not have, I mean, unless they fill it out, scan it, and send it back to us. Right. And I, I thought I heard Patrick say tonight that all the rec stuff's electronic and he's making snow boats, busters electronic. Is there a... Uh, that's, um, that's for volunteering for projects. It's not for committees. Yeah. I just I think... I mean, we can look in. Yeah. I just think eliminating that <laughs> hurdle where people have to print it out, fill it out, and then hand deliver it. Right. Create a PDF document. So I know there's one extra one application that needs to be processed. Right. Has it have any more people applied? No. Uh, okay. But we are um, we're working to see if we could maybe do that uh, either prior to next board meeting on the 27th or maybe first thing at 6. Okay. And then uh, I think we have an outstanding issue um, on uh, whether or not to revise the town code to allow uh, election signs to be put out uh, uh, 30 days before the drop of the mail-in ballot. Yeah, that was uh, something that was um, brought up, and I received a couple of comments from board board members, but nothing, not nothing from everybody. I didn't receive a comment from everyone. So, if you wanted to talk about, if you want us to look at that, um, give us that direction. I I do. I um, believe that um, with the deadline for um, submission of your, your uh, what's the word, notification that you're going to run falling in late August, it only makes sense to, so, to, to move up the, yeah, uh, the signs. The only caution that we have for you is that when you open it up, let's say you extend the 30-day election period to 45 day or 60 day, then anybody Right. They don't have to be an election. It could be just a private business who wants mm -hmm. to stick a sign in right away can have that sign up for the same I agree. Time. I know that. They can do that. For 30 days, they can still do that now. Yeah. Yeah. In the 30 days. Right. right. <laughs> my, my concern is that with the uh, mail-in ballots, as we all know, they hit two weeks before the election. So, in fact, voting decisions are being made two weeks earlier. And I think in the interest of keeping a level playing field for incumbents as well as new uh, residents who m may not have already been a trustee who want to run, I'd like to see that 30 days be 30 days before the the drop of the mail-in ballots. That's my personal opinion. Um, well, I <clears throat> I'd like to see us discuss it. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't know how we weighed in on it. I don't think we can do something in time for this election, but I think. For the future, it's worthwhile to discuss uh, a possible code change and consider. You know, the downside is the other signs that can go up for the longer period of time and just see how the board feels about it. But I don't see any harm in discussing it. In it certainly could be. Sense. It certainly could go through planning commission and get their thoughts about it and go from there. Once again, I don't know whether or not it's going to make sense. 
make it for this election, but we might as well get their input yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. It's okay. unlikely to make it this election because wow. you have to go to planning commission and then um, two readings of the board for the ordinance, and then uh, it's not effective for 30 days until 30 days from publication. So, but it's a good few. It's a, but yeah, we're recognizing the issue, and we should avoid if we think it's a problem. Should avoid it being a problem in the future anyway. Right. Yeah, I'm disappointed because I, I think we raised some of these election issues way back, and I'm disappointed to see that that one wasn't addressed before. Uh, or can, can I, if it can all, at all be taken care of before this election, I'd like to see it, see it taken care of. Well, it, it sounds from you that it's impossible. Unless you want a certain way to process. Right. Well. So right now it's just the signs, right? If once they're registered to be on the ballot, then they can go start going door to door right, and put yeah. their signs and up on doors. They can put their signs up, but only for a 24 hour period, then they'd have to take them down and move mm -hmm. them around town. That's a lot of work, but they can still put them up for a 24 hour period in the right way, right? Yeah. Signs can be in the right way for 24 hours. The attorney period. is leaning her head yeah, towards you. say the attorney uh, <laughs> Looks perplexed. Well, that's why I said they can yeah. serve their own yeah. There's an option for doing an emergency ordinance. An emergency would be that I'm just throwing that out Throwing there. it out there, yep. <laughs> Trying to give you some options that, you know, you would have to determine that it's an emergency based on the fact that this election is occurring now and that mail ballots are going out early and that you'd like to have those signs earlier. But that's totally right. Okay. Because so the emergency ordinances are effective upon adoption now. And sign, can signs go in people's yards? Yes. Prior to the when? prior to the thirty days. Thirty days. Oh, just the thirty days. Okay. okay. Well, I would like I would like a decision made on this whether or not we want to have this discussion at next meeting. Yeah, I I'd like to see this move forward, but I'm not real interested in doing an emergency ordinance on this. Uh, but I, yeah, I think that this should be addressed, and I think with mail-in ballots that we need to do something about it. But um, I hate to see us go through that process. And I, I, I kind of feel that this is new territory for us. This is November instead of April elections. And um, though it would be nice to anticipate what we need to do in, in terms of policy and what we need to change, but I think we're going to have to go through it to see if there's anything, any other issues besides the ballot mm -hmm. issues. But I do think that this is something that we should visit very soon and discuss it. But I I don't want to piecemeal. I feel that we should have all the information in front of us and know what other issues there might be. Um, this was something probably we should have thought about back yep. a year ago or Agreed, yeah. But you know, so be it. Yeah, I mean, the 30 days has been in place for a number of years, so. Yeah. And it was never an issue before <laughs> because of the mail in ballots. Right. So. The temporary sign issue that Matt was talking about, this, what the code says is the sign can remain in public right away for not more than 48 hours in any seven day period. So it's 48 in seven days. So in theory, somebody could come, put them up, move them, but it is an extra effort. How far do you have to move them? <laughs> Just these months. Just so, is it the case that the mail-in ballots got two weeks before the before the thirty days? Is that what you're saying? So, we'd be talking about six weeks of signs prior to the election. No, October fifteenth, the mail-in ballots are being yeah. yeah, two weeks before the thirty days. Okay, so uh, it seems to me, uh, you know, I'd be definitely willing to entertain. Um, trying to get something done. It seems to me it's fair to, to all candidates, and I don't want to see us looked at as trying to prohibit something or make anything more difficult or anything like that. I'd feel bad if that happened, but I, I'm, I'm willing to go either way, but I'm certainly willing to discuss that, it seems. Um, we, I don't think we discussed that sign issue in relation to mail-in ballots earlier. I don't think that can happen, so it's just become an issue since we recognize the implications of this mail and ballot issue. So I we I apologize to residents who who might want to be candidates for possibly putting them at, at a disadvantage and I'd be 
interested in seeing us address it or can see what we can do. Well, once again, I, I would put this on the Planning Commission's uh, calendar to consider and give us their input. As well as um, keep a running tally of other issues that we, you know, come across during this election time because you know we will. But I'm not dying to have signs up for two months. So. <laughs> okay. Anything else? No. Thank you. Town manager. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> schools starting to ramp up, which for me is a great time of the year. Kids are going to school. But uh, <laughs> that, um, we have implemented a modified pool schedule. So, um, because, and it's simply a matter of just having uh, the number of lifeguards that are being on. So uh, those have been posted, I think, to the website and also on the boards. And um, let's see, our new restaurant opened up in Rock Creek Village, Del Vecchio's. And I, if I could do a little plug, I'm not related at all, but it was fantastic. I've been there twice already, so kudos to the, or the owner, sorry. It was good. I went there, too. Met with Rocky Mountain Fire. Um, let's see. I guess this is the week Bob's site Met with the Deputy Chief Sterling Bolden and Board President who's Chuck Bolden and uh, their administrator, Pam Pass. Had some good discussion just about the fires that they've been battling this summer. And they're going to, we're going to work on a date that they can come uh, talk to the board about those fires and just impact on their department and uh, their operations. Um, they will all have an election question with regard to term limits for their board members probably in November, and then possibly a middle levy increase question as well. They're going to let me know about that. So I ask them if they can just give me a heads up, and I will let you know as soon as they know. They, they weren't sure. So. Okay. <laughs> when he's done, I have a question. Uh, Louisville Library uh, on the same page program. They'll have a meeting here um, as a book group on Monday, October 1st, and we'll get the information out um, to the community on that. Uh, the volunteer appreciation dinner date has been set for September 20th at 6 p.m., and we're going to have it at the Horizons Community Center. So if you want to, um, if you would like to go, if you, you could just email Katie Rimmel, our volunteer coordinator, uh, September 20th. Did you say that date again? September 20th at 6 p.m. Uh, as was mentioned, Jay is moving the evening. He took his job with the state. He seems to be pretty excited about that. So I'm happy for him. <laughs> uh, sales tax revenue was up in June, 7%. So that's uh, good news. And we're up 4.5% uh, for the year over last year. So. Good job. <laughs> Take personal credit for that. Uh, yeah. uh, and then Congressman Polis will be hold, hosting a town hall meeting uh, this coming Saturday from, at 12 p.m. here in the border. And how will that meeting be conducted? What's that? Is it going to be casual? Uh, is he going to be sitting up in a panel? No, it'll be it, typically there. We have tables set up and it's just casual in the round type of thing. But Perfect. They usually set up the room however they want that day. So, when did you say that was? Uh, this is that day, uh, from 12 to 2 p.m. Yes, Trustee Scumatz. So I do have a question, and it had to do with your discussion about the fires and so on. Yeah. And so, I do they? You know, I was worried about the reverse 911 and people registering and all that. Do they ever do tests of the reverse 911 so we don't end up in? the situation that maybe a neighboring community had with the fire, did they ever test those? I don't know. I have followed with Sergeant J. Merlin and see um, what the dispatch office does there. Uh, I, I just don't know, but I, I'll follow up. Would you, I'd be really yeah. interested. It, it makes me nervous. So. Lisa, if I could follow up on that, I was really surprised to, if I'm accurately portraying this, and if anybody knows differently, please say, uh, apparently if you're a Comcast voice customer, you're actually a, 
Ian, help me out here. A VOIP customer, and you're not a phone customer, so you won't get your reverse call back? Um, Has that been well, modified? Yeah, I have talked to Sergeant Chamberlain about that, and he says they have um, overcome those issues. Great. Okay. <coughs> Anything else? Nope. Town Attorney? Nothing for me, please. Town Clerk? All right, thanks. That brings us to item number five, public comment on consent agenda and non-agenda items. Hello, George. George Governor Superior, I have a question. Has there uh, been any behind-the-scenes discussion on the Hot 36 underpass for bicycles with the town of neighboring town lately? No. We put some... Uh, you put some kind of restrictions on it, and I want to get a follow-up on that, which you were talking It's actually about. on the agenda tonight. No. It's part, part this of is the You're speaking of the other. Yeah, it's part, part of that. The latest on that is... <coughs> so just uh, in case people know where, where they're coming from. So this is the... Under, you're speaking of the underpass uh, at Davidson Mesa that would cross over to Marshall Road and then currently doesn't connect to anything. So that, that's the underpass you're referring to. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Magley. So, uh, yeah, the, the condition you mentioned was that um, it connect on, a, on the south side of Highway 36, um, that that bikeway portion connect to the fire parking right. And uh, CDOT, uh, was that today? Yeah, so CDOT had uh, wanted to put together a meeting of the bikeway. There's a bikeway uh, group that um, had done a lot of work prior to uh, on the alignment of the bikeway, and then there's been some recommended changes. One, ours is one of them. And so they wanted to put together a meeting of that group just to discuss all these changes at once. And we and uh, so that meeting was held today. I haven't had a chance to get an update on it. So that's what we were waiting on was that, that meeting to happen. So. Okay, I'll wait. let me know, will you please? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Additional public comments? I have a quick question. Um, now, I if you wouldn't mind, just name and kind of Judy location where you live. Superior. Okay. Superior. Yeah, okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, so I had a quick question. Um, I had emailed um, Chris concerning um, the restriping in front of the school. And I was wondering exactly um, how that information was sent out to people. I got it through the um, Superior Elementary Creekside, and I know there are a lot of people who didn't have information on that, and I consider myself somewhat knowledgeable. Like I know the pool schedule, uh, you know, I know there's <laughs> issues at Colton and um, Indiana. What's going to be built there? I know about the underpass, but I didn't know about the restriping. And I guess I'm concerned um, as a parent, as far as the safety. I think there's going to be parents who just kind of pull in those parking areas and let kids out there. I think there's going to be cyclists coming through and cars coming in and out. And I'm concerned as far as the backup, um, as far as traffic is concerned. So those are my concerns. And I was just wondering how that information was really sent out to the community, because there's a lot of people who um, were unaware that that was going to happen. I think a lot of people knew that there was going to be um, repaving of a lot of roads, but not knowledgeable as far as restriping of that area for the school. And who started that whole process? Um, so let's see, the way it was sent out, I'm not sure. So I know it went through the creek side, and I'm not sure if it was sent out to the rest of the community. I don't think so. No, the principal had sent that out to her. <laughs> and there was a desire from the, from the principal's office to restripe that to provide more parking. Um, so I think that, that part of this is trying to accommodate her wish regarding that particular issue. Once again, as I said earlier, I, I not sure I w would recommend restriping it, but that was sort of the direction that the school wanted to see. I think it's going to be potentially problematic, like Trustee Hansen and others have brought up. But um, uh, I will just have to. Yeah, yeah, we were just trying. To yeah, I know. I, and this is not right. With additional park right, I'm not I, trying to say I, anything bad about. Real concern. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I mean. I'm not trying to say anything negative to staff. I think <laughs> I think you were trying to accommodate exactly what. Just, you know, I mean, we try to be interactive and 
help the schools out whenever we can, and I think that we were trying to, and I thank staff for doing this, for trying to implement what their desires are, but I think it is going to potentially be problematic, especially with bicyclists and the, uh, and the number of parents that are going to now not want to try to go into the parking lot and are going to try to drop off at school hours along the sidewalk. But be a backup for parking. So, right, the parking lot will be back up through yeah. the street now. It's um, but I think that the, I think we'll have to just see how this goes, and my guess is it's going to need to have some modification um, based upon trial and error. But uh, I think most of us, probably all of us up here, share some of your concerns. And we'll uh, we will get together tomorrow morning and as a staff and, and um, discuss it one last time before we mm -hmm. that final. <laughs> Lunch, so. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> Additional public comments? Seeing none, that brings to item number six uh, presentations, and we have uh, two items for this evening. Uh, first is uh, uh, recognitions of all our volunteers on our various committees. And um, if I read this proclamation, I just I think we all share our uh, heartfelt. Uh, Thanks uh, to everybody who participates. It um, can potentially be long hours and a thankless job, and it's the community is much better because of everybody's participation. So, um, with that, I'd like to read a proclamation of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior in appreciation of the service of outgoing members of the Town of Superior Planning Commission, the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Trails Advisory Committee, and the Open Space Advisory Committee. Whereas, through their volunteerism in serving on the Planning Commission, the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space and Trails Advisory Committee, and the Open Space Advisory Committee, these residents are to be commended for their committed efforts to help make, out, uh, make our community a better place to live, play, and work. I'm going to need some water or something. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. These are long sentences. Uh, well, some members of, and participants of the Planning Commission and advisory committees have been strong advocates on behalf of the citizens of Superior, and whereas these individuals generously have shared their skills and dedication by taking an active role in shaping the future of the town of Superior, whereas the town of Superior, excuse me, <coughs> uh, has benefited from the volunteer, volunteer time, energy, and thoughtful participation on the planning commission and advisory committees. Therefore, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the town of Superior. My wife. Oh, it was a clean thank you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, think this, I appreciate this. Um, therefore, the town of Superior. Well, I have two, two now. Thanks. Uh, and the town of Board hereby proclaim our appreciation for a significant contribution to the community and for the service on the Trails uh, Planning Commission, the Parks, Recreation, Open Space and Trails Advisory Committee, and the Open Space Advisory Committee. In particular, for Planning Commission members John Craycraft and Ian Elverson. Open Space Advisory Committee members Tom Pratt, Dana D'Souza, Bob McCool, John Nybarter, and Jim Payne, and Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Trails Advisory Committee members John Nybarter, Lars Morales, Greg Tan, Lloyd Linnell, and Nathan Ruff. With that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I don't know if we have the proclamations. Maybe we can. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> Good. So maybe uh, those that are in attendance What's can that? come up um, and we can <laughs> hand you out your proclamation. Appreciate it. Now it's funny. It's like, oh my gosh. You get halfway through it. Yeah. Welcome to my life.
All right, thank you once again. So that brings us to a uh, presentation by the Superior Chamber of Commerce, and welcome. Good evening, Heather Craycraft with the Superior Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this opportunity as we get to visit each month, I would love to advertise our Chili Fest. Um, the Chamber works very closely with the town in this event, and it is probably one of the most uh, anticipated events of the season. Luckily, it's our last event of the season, too, so we kind of culminate with it. But this is um, the event that I believe brings not only the the locals in um, to our town as well as the regional and I think we get a few that even travel in so they are chili cooks they are fanatical about their chili and if you've never attended I would like to extend the invitation on September 8th at 3 p.m. we have a lineup of great music this year um, Katie the new event coordinator has done a phenomenal job of putting together an entertainment package that I believe will attract the young and the older um, to the selection of music, as well as some great restaurants, honestly, that we are expanded our People's Choice competition this year, that um, all of those things are free. So the only thing you purchase is if you want to taste the competitive chili, and all those um, funds are supporting the Boulder County Incident Management Team, which we all believe, obviously, in, and um, they will take care of us if anything does um, come up. So if anyone has any questions, the town um, website has ever all the information. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to item number seven, consent agenda. And on the consent agenda this <coughs> evening is approval of the minutes of the July 23rd, 2012 Board of Trustees meetings, acceptance of the minutes of the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Trails Advisory Committee meeting, approval, um, excuse me, approval of a liquor license renewal for Rock Creek Wine and Spirits, Adoption of a, a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with Boulder County Clerk and Recorder for the uh, conduct of the administration of the 2012 general election. Adoption of a resolution approving an agreement with Superior Salvage and Maintenance LLC for the 2012 Coal Creek at McCaslin Bridge Guardrail Repair Project. And approval of an alcohol permit for possession and consumption on public uh, property, Mohar. With that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda by Trustee Skuma, second by Trustee Williams. Discussion? Phyllis? Cirelli? Yes. Gregor? <coughs> Hansen? Yes. Buckle? Yes. Pennington? Yes. Skuma? Yes, abstaining from the minutes. Okay. Williams? Yes. Great. Thanks, that motion carries. That brings us to item number eight. Discussion and approval of installing a triple left turn improvements at Marshall Road and the Chasm Boulevard intersection. A mass exit. At the mass. I thought they were all coming for the triple left. Uh, okay, with that, Mr. Magley, yes. Public Works Superintendent Alex Arnella has a presentation for the board on these improvements. Um, one thing that he will point out that I would like to also point out is um, if the board would like to proceed with these improvements, I'd like to um, get a, a approval from the board of a not to exceed amount so that we can work with our current um, contractors to get these improvements done by the first part of November before the holiday rush shopping period starts. So if we go through our normal bidding process, um, we wouldn't be able to get these done in time. But with that, I'll turn it over to Alex. Alex, superintendent. Um, you've seen uh, this project several times. Uh, a couple of things have changed since you've seen it last. Um, originally, we looked at uh, trying to keep the ex existing lane configuration and make um, the through lane a, a through left. That was one, I think, which you had seen left. There were a couple of issues with that when we submitted that to CDOT and looked at uh, how that would work. First of all, we'd have to implement a split phase, which means that this whole approach would have to go, and then the other approach going eastbound would have to go. What that does is introduce some additional uh, all red, yellow time into the, into the uh, equation. You know, I was concerned about it, concerned about the traffic backing up uh, into the interchange. <coughs> also, they requested because this was turning, there's a traffic single pole on the uh, northeast <coughs> corner, and they felt that needed to be moved, and that would 
have uh, increased the cost uh, about thirty thousand dollars to move that pole. Uh, subsequently, we've been through the design, uh, the diverging diamond interchange concept, and we've uh, seen how that could operate and if that would be implemented. Uh, it would be really good to have a triple left here in order to to uh, reduce the this, this single phase on this. Right now we operate at a 100 second single phase and the interchange with the diverging diamond would probably operate with a shorter single uh, single cycle at 90 seconds and so uh, to have this coordinated with the interchange would be nice to decrease the cycle length here. So that's another added benefit of doing that. Also you've seen the town center plans and there's been a traffic study there and if that moves, moves forward uh, we would need a triple left because we're handling more traffic from the, the east side. So for those, those reasons, we uh, looked at adding, going back and, and taking this median, some of this median out. Uh, again, we have some nice landscaping, which is you know, a critical thing that you need to be aware of, and replacing, taking, uh, putting asphalt in there and a concrete uh, uh, curb and gutter separation, you know, three foot wide. Separating the, the lanes on the east and west lanes on on uh, Marshall. So our recommendation. So we move forward. Uh, in terms of the triple lanes and why we want to do this is to provide a lane that would go handle all the traffic that would be turning at the interchange going to Boulder. The middle lane would be dedicated to serving Louisville traffic, and the outer lane would be uh, dedicated to serving traffic that would want to go right and go to Denver uh, at US 36. Uh, the again, concerns that they had about the split phase, if you go back and, and take it out of, make the through left, uh, make the through lane the through left, these are some of the concerns that uh, CDOT had on its coordination with the DDI design and the town center. So this is, uh, again, a plan view of what we'd be doing, taking landscaping away from the median, uh, filling in that with asphalt, reconstructing this portion of the median as a concrete uh, lined uh, uh, median, three, three foot in, in width. So we'd have a turn, turn like here, we're actually taking some uh, uh, area of this median in order to make, make sure trucks have enough room to, to make that particular turn. Um, we do doing some minor restriping and doing some signing changes. We think we can get away without making, uh, adding single heads, but adding uh, some signs on this mass line. Hey, Alex, can you go back to that slide? So where is the diverging diamond compared on here? And, and up here. When, once we have that, it, this won't impact that at all, good or bad? It'll still be, this will still be the optimum choice? Yes, well, I mean, in terms of triple left, I mean, this, yeah. this would be a good configuration for that because they, they flow into the, there's three lanes here, you know, one, one lane, three lanes go through the crossover. So we have three lanes coming here, one, this would be kind of a shared uh, through right, and we have three lanes going through the crossover intersection, which is right about up there. Okay. And that median portion that we would be removing, we have some, uh, on Marshall there, we have some of that red line sandstone. We would look to reuse that someplace else in town, rather than just... You know, up here? Yeah. yeah. This is the, uh, some of the goals. We're gonna, uh, this is on McCaslin, taking just a, a portion of that. And this is kind of the, the uh, uh, treatment that we have on the, the new median uh, on Marshall. Separating the, the lanes on Marshall. So, would you have to move that limit line back then for the other, yeah, that side of traffic? Yes, the crosswalk gets gets moved back a little bit, so so people will turn where, where cars are uh, stopped. Uh, so we've already started to set up on on this because this is Kansas looking south. Here's Marshall coming through. This used to be a dedicated right turn lane going into. Superior Plaza. If you notice, we've just taken that out. <laughs> this, uh, this, these arrows are gone now. So we have to skip striping, and this is all set up for three receiving lanes for the triple left. So the striping is done for that particular portion of the project. Um, ex 
existing uh, queues right now uh, at the PM peak hour, uh, and here's the real reason why we're doing that. Queues extend uh, right about to where the lane starts. So first, first Avenue is pretty much blocked during the peak hours. I know I, whenever I go home, I always use second because I'm not, I know this is pretty hard to, to go back. With the triple left, we're predicting that queues would be uh, reduced to this uh, amount during peak hours. Again, if we if we change the cycle length, they may extend a little farther back. But we have that flexibility if the if the DDI does get um, implemented. Alex, I'm having trouble hearing hearing <laughs> some some of this. This, this is what would happen today. Okay. I'm sorry. Right now we have queues with the Correct. double left turn. That's how the queues are. With today's traffic and the PM, this is how the queues would be reduced with the triple left. And repeat for me how that affects the margin coming off um, original town, that road right there? Right here. So, yeah. so now you're not blocked. Right. So you okay. can get into a, a turn lane, whereas right now during peak hours, it's pretty hard to get from here into a, into a turn lane. But Alex, did I read here, though, that this doesn't solve the traffic issues on weekends or at other times? At, at weekends, we have uh, longer queues, but we also provide more green time to this movement on, on uh, is the traffic on, on McCaslin is lighter. Um, I think the, the queues are similar, but um, on the real peak days, the Friday after <coughs> some of those peak days, we have longer queues, but on most of the Saturday peak periods, the queues are, are similar to what we have now okay. during the PM peak. And what's the grade this intersection gets as it is now? The overall, the side streets get pretty, as far as level service. Yeah. The queues um, are in my memo. It's rated uh, level service D. I think during the PM peak era, level service C during the AM peak era. During the A, sorry, I'm doing this for a reason. During the AM, it's Thank level you. service C, and, level, and during the evening peak hour, it's level service D. Thank you. And most of the most of the time, vehicles are getting through. Joint, you know, if you come come up to this queue, uh, you know, most of the time, <laughs> at the end of the queue, you may not make it through, but. Most of the time, anybody in this queue gets through on the, the next uh, cycle when it changes. Thanks. If it was level of service E or F, you'd come up here and you'd have to wait an additional cycle to, to get through. So we're not at that, at that point yet. Thanks. Okay. Okay, the, over, the overhead sign, we had uh, several options before. Um, we're planning on, on the mast arm to put in three arrows on the mast arm. This would say left, left only, Boulder, Louisville, and Denver at the bottom. Obviously, from far back, those it's hard to read. When you get right up to it, you can see it, but you want to do your lane, you know, you want to make your lane decision much farther up. So I've been advocating a, an overhead sign like this, and I know there's been some concerns from the board about the intrusiveness of, of a sign like this. This is kind of a highway sign. We looked at options for a, a span wire sign, and I think we showed you in the, in the packet um, an example of a, of a sign that's on State Highway 128 as you're going up to uh, Wadsworth, where the new 120th extends through. They have a, a, a span wire, so just a wire with signs hanging on it. Uh, but those signs are just saying they have lane assignments in terms of arrows. They don't have any lettering in terms of uh, cities where you're going. Uh, I don't think we can get um, the lettering on those signs to be readable because they we can only make those those span wire signs so big to to be held by the span wire. Uh, we also have issues with the span wire in terms of 100 mile an hour winds and so forth. So my recommendation would be not to use the span wire, either do this or our recommendation tonight is is to not do an overhead sign at this point, to go ahead and implement the change, see how things are operating, and evaluate the need for an overhead sign 
uh, as we had get some more experience. Okay. And in terms of timing, um, again, to go through the normal bidding process and bid it out, uh, get the cars on the street, go through our bidding process, so it would be difficult to get construction going this year. We'd have to wait till next spring. But we do have contractors that we've we have unit prices established for quantities like asphalt removal, curb and gutter removal, striping. So we, we have a lot of those prices that have been bid out already that we can ask our contractors to uh, do this project with the, the unit prices they've all already given us. And so that's what we're asking for tonight for you give it to town manager the authority to negotiate a, a change order with those contractors to implement the project and get it done this year. Okay, thank you very much. Questions from the board? Jesse Hansen. Alex, is there any way to tell what percentage of the traffic is repeat traffic? Like how, how often? Is eighty percent is local traffic that I'd is there every at day? At least eighty percent. I mean go through that it go through on a regular basis that they know. Okay. Uh, and you know, regular Costco users, they're Costco members and so they've been there before. Um, so it may be higher. I mean a lot of people when they go through have been there have been through before. Yeah. My concern with this big sign there's a a good expense to that, but once you go through here once and you realize that the far left lane is for Boulder only, you're going to remember that. Mm -hmm. That maybe the sign, we don't need to have it there because people are going to know it already. The only, the only the thing I can tell you, I mean, and this isn't as big a change as what we made when we did the loop at the interchange. And as you, as you know, we put a sign up there that wasn't visible, so you don't get very many clues that you need to be in the right lane instead of the left lane as you're going south. And if you've ever seen people make U-turns still today, we have a couple of people making U-turns and going back to the turnpike. So that that is a little bit bigger an issue because, you know, you're, the maneuver, if you miss it, you don't know what to do and you're making some bad maneuvers. Here, what's going to happen, if you if you get in the wrong lane, you're going to weave as, you, as you're on McCaslin. You may weave, weave over one lane. I don't think you're going to make a mistake where you're in an inside lane and you want to go to Boulder. I don't think people are going to make that type of mistake. And then what's your experience on putting paying the sign in the, in the road or some kind of direction in the road that this lane is for Boulder? Can you do that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's part, we discussed of, that in the that's part of the plan. And, okay. and so that'll be implemented. But again, snow and ice conditions, you know, oh, yeah. sometimes they get, they get covered up. Okay. So, we, you know, we're, we're saying like you are, maybe we can solve the problem. Maybe it isn't that, that big a problem. Um, so we will, I, I was recommending it because I, my experience with the interchange, and I see that all the time, people are still missing that. And so I, I always felt that we, we had it in before. We had that in the original plan. We cut that out because of the budget limitations, an overhead sign on McCaslin on the Louisville side. But here, and so that's why I'm, I'm recommending that you put it in. But because of the budget and the schedule right now, let's, you know, see if there is a problem and put it in and, and monitor the situation. Trustee Scamatz. Yeah, I really dislike this sign, and I, I, I wouldn't want to see us put something that big in. Ugly, and this is pretty much a quote of what I said last time that this came up. Um, if you, I, I, I'm happy to do a wait and see, and the paint in the road will be one thing. If we need to have a sign like that one that says something about must turn left or something, I can't read what that white sign is, and I don't remember what it we'll says. Have, we'll have a sign. Uh, but if that side could say something like, you know, we'll have a sign here that's, that's a green sign that yeah. has three arrows on it and it's fine. The, the lettering there. So we'll have. That we'll seems have a sign funny like to that. me. Um, unless proven otherwise, because this is big, overkill, expensive, and hideous. <laughs> How do you really feel about it? Yeah. <laughs> Are there questions from the board? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, find out about the timing on the construction of this, the completion of it. When would that timing occur? In September and October. So we could get it done well, before the holidays. If we are, if our contractors are are uh, cooperative and they, you know, give us the prices we we feel uh, are warranted based on the unit prices and they're available to do it, again we're we haven't sprung them on, on them yet. So we think we can, you know, I'm sure our, the the street project, for example, will be if they're on schedule. They should be done by the end of August. So we could roll right into this. If we have the plans ready and they're all set to go. So. It could, it could start as early as uh, mid-September and be completed by November 1st. Is there any way that um, 
either get assurances or um, kill the project until after the holidays if we cannot get it done by the holidays? Yeah, uh, you know, we'll, we'll ask for, you know, from com completion de deadline from our contractors, and if they don't think they're going to get it done. Yeah, I'm not having this happen if <laughs> it's right, during holiday rush time, so, yeah, I agree yeah. with you. It's a very crucial time for, yeah. you know, residents and uh, our sales tax. Yeah. Just I have a follow on to that also. The, and are we in this position of having to do this not bid approach and all the rest of that stuff because of CDOT negotiations or what happened? How? Because how, I know we saw this ages ago, so how come we're now in a position I, to, to have to make a decision about without the normal bidding process, without, you know, with some concern that we might roll over to the well, holiday process? I, one of the biggest ones is we wanted to make sure uh, we had a good idea of what the interchange improvement would look like. <coughs> whether it was going to be the diversion diamond or something else, and make sure that if we do these improvements, it's going to work with that. So that's kind of been the delay. That's been the biggest delay in my mind. Right, and in terms of uh, all the modeling work that you saw with the, the diverging diamond and the decent, you know, the stuff, uh, the consultants there, we gave them, you know, the plan for the triple left, like you've seen here. <coughs> they modeled that, and they felt it would work with the diverging diamond. Weren't there some funds for this, either through CDOT or do we not have those funds? Uh, there, it's currently budgeted. This project's budgeted in the Superior McCaslin Interchange District at one hundred fifty thousand. But the answer is no. I don't think we have any money coming from other sources. Okay. I'm sorry, Trustee Pennington. Um, last year, I believe. We sent this in, over to the Planning Commission to take a look, and it doesn't sound to me like we're building in any Planning Commission review. Is it possible to have them give us a final? Well, um, is that? We, we received the Planning Commission's recommendation, and um, it, um, the design hasn't um, changed a whole lot to where we um, went back to seek their input. What was their recommendation? Um, it was to proceed with the project, and then um, it, the signage part was the only part. I don't remember what their final recommendation was. To do the five lanes? Did they recommend proceeding with the triple left, <coughs> straight, and right turn? Uh, no, because I don't think we, what we were at that time were recommending was the, not the ad additional lane, but using the middle lane or the outside line is a through left is what we were I doing. guess so uh, modifying my question is it possible to send this back to planning commission get their recommendation bring it back to the board and still meet um, some requ the requirements you would have to try to get it in, in due time before the holidays can you can you be putting out those requests for bids or matching existing prices, et cetera, concurrently? If I, we might be able to get it on their next meeting if the board, um, but then we would need, I think the board would want us to bring back if they had significant changes, and then that, that would. So if you got our final say so on the 28th, is that too late? When's the next planning commission meeting, I guess? Is a question. Uh, the next planning commission is August 21st, yes. Right. So it could then come back the 28th. So we're, we're delaying <coughs> a decision on it until the well, 28th. Uh, how does that work with contractors? Well, I mean, it probably can take us two weeks to get uh, bids back from the anyway. prices back from the contractors. So it's not. Can we do it concurrently? I mean, I, I could take it to the, to the planning commission. On Okay with the agenda setter. Is anybody else interested in having yes. planning yes. commission way back in? I'd like to even add Trustee Williams and then Trustee Scomas. Um God, I can't believe it. It just flew out the window. Trustee Scomas. So um I'm gonna ask one question about that modeling. So the the third from the left lane, or I guess the middle lane, okay. Third from left, third from the right lane. Um, 
the, the models didn't look as good when it was a straight or left. It seems like 80% of the traffic goes left, and I don't understand why you don't have effectively the same thing from, from that kind of a mo um, Because you're, you're adding another yellow all red, uh, and it's only like four or five seconds, but in this intersection, that's real near capacity. It's just there's a potential for for issues with that. We showed we showed C dot we showed C dot you know the the analysis whether it, with the through left and they still had concerns that it would back up into the interchange and they they just wanted to put conditions on us doing this that we'd have to tear it out or do you know fix the problem down the road if it be, became uh, issues backing up into the interchange. And the other, the other thing that happened is that the pole, <coughs> they asked that the pole be moved. Asked them what? They asked that the, the traffic single pole on that corner be moved. Um, okay, that wasn't... Uh, if, that's if we didn't add the additional lane. If yeah, we didn't. Went with the current configuration of the intersection. I'm confused, but all right, uh, maybe everybody else understands that. I didn't understand that answer, really sorry to say. But then the other question I had was, okay, you've talked about the, the we're going to take away some of the median, and it's only going to be three foot wide near the front. Does that mean it's going to look like a Jersey barrier? No, it's going to. It's going to be really narrow, short? It just looks like a three foot curb? I see. See what you have here? But that's why the That's why, but it's it's going to look at that. It's going to be about three foot wide. I know it's going to. It seems to me that's going to be really easy to go over or whatever. But okay. It'll be raised. I mean, it'll be raised with curb and gutter, and it'll be a, a barrier curb. And did everybody else understand that left and straight thing? Okay. It's the same type on on the bridge right now. That's that's the type of width you have on the, on the bridge going over okay. Manhattan over the turnpike. It's the same kind of width. Trustee yes. Williams. So if the diverging diamond interchange does not occur and it's a different interchange or the interchange doesn't even happen, what happens here? The triple left will still work with what's out there today. Correct. Or for something else, like the Triple left on the bridge to. Uh, <coughs> well, it would be a double left. Double left, I mean, it works sorry. with that as well. Yeah. It would work with that. Sure. Okay. I, I, just, has a question. Um, I just hate the idea of being in a hurry. So that, that bugs me. Um, well, but in staff's mind, I mean, Plans are set. See that approved them. I mean, in, our, in my mind, this project's ready to go. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I had a, a quick question, and then we'll have public comment. Um, so with the potential, well, I mean, with the, the extension of Marshall Road across into the town center, does that? all line up with this? I, I assume it does since we haven't <coughs> constructed it, but how, how does that work? Well, a couple things that, that may happen down the road with the town center coming in. Uh, and the town center develops like we want it to develop. We may need a double left here, southbound double left. And so this median then would have to be reduced in some Laying, you know, we need a couple of feet to make to get a barrier across here. You know, again, a skinny, <laughs> skinny uh, separation. So we need a double left here. We'll, we'll probably need a double left here, which which lines up that will come out of this median. So this double left would line up and uh, be okay with with that triple left. But that's a single left, right? Yeah, I, I mean, a single, a single straight right coming now, off that. Single left. The through would stay. The through right would stay. We need a, a double left here, and we probably need a double left there. And we might need a double straight. From right the other now, side. it is a double straight. From the other side. From there. From here. Yes. So, a single. 
what you're telling me, though, this that this... Okay. This is okay. Camille, uh, we wouldn't need it. We don't have to re... We wouldn't need to redo what anything that we're doing here. No. Uh, we may have to what do the some towns stuff are. over here. Okay. But regardless of whether we do this triple one. Regardless. Yes. And then just in terms of the landscape, how far back is that going that you're taking it out? Well, if you go out there right now, you see this is the, the taper for the existing lanes. And we're just going to carry that line straight to here. So we're carrying this through. It's about, here's a taper. So you're going to take this taper. <coughs> So all the trees are gone. Is that what you're telling me? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, all, all of these. This one probably gets saved, maybe. That one. Maybe all those. Okay. And if we move the road instead of making the triple left uh, there, we widen the road to the right. Would that work? Over here. Uh huh. Then you're taking the lane. Do we have, is, do you know how far back the road our right of way goes? Or is that right at the property probably line? Right. The sidewalk is probably in our right of way. You know, part of the, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I want to make the roads work. I want people to be able to get in and out of there safely. I don't want anything to back up. But part of the appealing aspect of this uh, development, I think, is it's just looks nice compared to many different places. And um, I know landscaping is just landscaping, but it turns out, I think, to be a big draw. Um, so I guess I have a little concern regarding that issue. The uh, triple left talking about here was shown in the original plans for the, the marketplace mm -hmm. and their traffic study anticipated need for a triple left and designed that median to be taken out at some point so it was the get-go of the marketplace anticipated yeah I don't want to take landscaping either <laughs> yeah, yeah I guess I'd have to see I mean <laughs> it's just at just concrete I'd, and only three feet I'd, you know. a long way that makes me nervous Okay. Well, those are my concerns. Um, is there any public comment regarding this particular issue? Seeing none. Uh, I had board. a couple of questions about, yes. Trustee Sorelli. about the schedule again that we're talking about. What, um, can you, what do you, how long is the construction period do you anticipate? It's probably three weeks to a month. So we want to be done by November 1st. So you're talking start no later than October 1st? Yeah, preferably mid-September. Mid-September, yeah. And you know, to get bids, you know, even if we use our change order process, you're talking about two weeks to get bids. And what do you think the uh, prep time the contractor needs if he get, gives you a bid and then gets told to start? How much, what's his notice? How long does he need to get started after he gets a notice to proceed? Uh, a week. I mean, so you're adding, is that, that's not part of your construction time then? No. So that's a third week. So we're, we're really close right now. And we're unsure. Other board questions or? So my, my comment is that uh, thank you to staff for working on this. We definitely need to put in a triple left um, for, to make this work. Um, I'm hoping the town center comes in soon and we can do all of this and we'll have so much traffic uh, there, people coming to Superior, that, that'll be a great thing. Um, I'm concerned, uh, and I, I don't actually have any particular 
issue with the change order process. I think that is fine. The dollar figure seems reasonable. We're not. It's always been. It's below what we budgeted for. Um, but I'd like for this to go through planning commission, and I think that that's going to push the outer limit. And if we had any delay for weather or whatever, then we're into the holiday season, and that causes me great concern. So my preference would be to do this in the first part of 2013. Yeah, and, you know, we would have brought this uh, to the board much sooner, but with, uh, with yep. what we knew what we were doing at the interchange. Yep. So this this is this is nothing negative to staff. I mean, I, you know that this is what we were anticipating and I hate to doing. Be out but I and see uh, in the third week in November and traffic's back to past Center Drive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I understand. Yeah. I think we'll with, um, so many outstanding issues from Double Diamond to Comp Plan to Town Center to everything that actually proceeding somewhat slowly on this feels more appropriate and. If we plan, if we want to just sort of accept that it will be a 2013 project, I would actually like to see um, salvaging the median as is. I actually think that row of trees. I actually just was admiring that as I was heading up so towards Marshall and Boulder the, the other day. I really hate to get rid of that. To me, those in this town takes so long to get established I'd hate to see him go so I'd actually like to see a um, model as to if we try to do it on the right side here what <coughs> can be done and how it how it would look if if we did it that way the board thoughts I'm good at that just a question real quick on the uh, on the cost so the the improvements and then the signage at the on the existing pole, that's 120,000, and then it'd be an additional 60,000 if we did the the big one. Yeah. So it's actually it would be 180,000, and we had budgeted 150. Yes. Okay. Okay. But well, we are recommending we delay with the sign. Right. <clears throat> no, I think all that makes sense. I mean, everything else presented, I think, makes sense to a little trial and error, see how things go with the. Right. Right. Without the yeah. big signage yeah. package. Yeah, one comment on the uh, making the, the lane. You know, we have to make this a through lane. You know, and the problem we had was we had a pole over there that had, would have to be moved. But I think uh, we were having a difficult time with the town center keeping that pole anyway. And it wasn't for because of the town center per se. It was because the bike lane issue that. Now we're trying to get bike lanes on the like on the Caslin with the DDI, so to get bike lanes and, and the town center to work, that pole now looked like it may might have be going to anyway. anyway. So that was one of the reasons why they didn't come here because that pole would have, would have had to be moved. So that may not be a, as big a consideration as the anymore. town center plans. Justice Gomez, I think I'd rather hold and go through it. Up. Planning Commission and a bidding process, and that just strikes me as, as better. And I think it's really important that we think about the bike lanes and that DDI. I just, this weekend I saw some poor guy out there doing that sort of cross-country skiing thing, and he was right on the on the line that was painted because there was nowhere for him to go. And I, I was looking going, I can't believe he's doing that. So, yeah. All right, thanks to staff, but I think that the direction is, unless the board feels otherwise, is that we'll do this for the normal process, have it go through planning commission and go out for formal bids um, and hopefully be able to do this first, you know, in spring of 2013. And I assume CDOT's okay with, they don't have any yeah, urgency with that. coordinating with the DDI right now, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That brings us to item number nine, discussion regarding the interchange bridge design and landscape concept. Mr. Mangley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So this is uh, the item that we went through with the uh, joint in the joint meeting with the Louisville City Council a month ago uh, seven, yeah it's about a month ago um, and uh, I had uh, emailed their city manager to see if they were interested in meeting a second time just to go over what concepts had come up with uh, based on the direction that was given to staff and the consultants at that joint meeting and they felt like they had uh, 
what they needed to proceed with uh, the design concepts and railing that were being uh, uh, recommended. And um, so we thought we'd go ahead and schedule it for our board to hear at, at our meeting and get comments and um, recommendations from the town board. And we will forward those on to FHU, who's our consultant, as well as the city of uh, Louisville, based on the conversation tonight. And Alex uh, has a presentation for the board. Great, thanks. And uh, yeah, something I forgot to mention, at that joint meeting, the direction to staff and consultant was um, to develop design and landscape elements for the interchange improvements with a not to exceed amount of $500,000 to be split 50-50 um, between the city of Louisville and the town of And how did, how did that come out? Is Alex going to address yes, that? Yes, that's what okay. he's going to Okay. okay. Um, just an update on uh, what's been happening with our design process. Our consultants have been uh, busy at work trying to implement uh, the direction from the uh, joint meetings of the uh, city council and town board. Um, what I have to present tonight is what they've actually submitted to CDOT in terms of the uh, bridge railing and the enhanced landscaping and the DDI uh, design. Uh, as well as an update on the pedestrian underpass. So as, as you recall, we had discussions about the, the shape and the character of the bridge railing and uh, from the direction of the board is to, from the, two, the joint meeting is to have um, an art uh, situation kind of mim mimicking the uh, RTD pedestrian bridge arc. In this case, uh, we couldn't make it that big uh, from a structural standpoint, so we're just anchoring at the center pier and the abutments and having tie downs uh, down to the, uh, the bridge railing. Um, the other uh, issues were the abutments and how they would be stand out with the lettering that could be read from, from the highway. And that's how this had, had come out to be. Um, and then landscaping, get various. So, you know, in terms of landscaping, we'll have more formal arrangements uh, that are in a more conspicuous areas near the abutments on the uh, <coughs> island and on the islands uh, that direct traffic. Here's the uh, bike lane configuration. And you can see here, I know there's a lot of debate on the height of the, of the uh, Jersey barrier, how that would be uh, formatted. And I think this is how the consensus came out. I know uh, Trustee Williams <laughs> disagreed on that, but that's how it came out. Um, so Alex, is that 30 inches? I thought we agreed on 30. Is that what that is? Yes. Okay. And then the type of landscaping, more formal, near the bridge, uh, non-irrigated, more rural type landscaping uh, uh, on the main line. And they pr produce some nice uh, drainage, uh, ir landscaping details of how to handle the drainage and so forth that the staff has uh, reviewed. Again, here's the, the more rural type landscaping in these areas and then the more urban type in the landscape islands. Detail, so we're starting to get some detail from, from the design and direction from the board. Here's the uh, retaining wall uh, details. This is actually the, the uh, underpass where you going uh, west on McCann under McCaslin and then under the, the ramp to the RTD station. So that's moving forward. That's been submitted, and CDOT's reviewing that to try to get into the uh, 
RFP. Also, at the direction of the board, we've talked about um, um, underpass of McCaslin, and our consultants have taken that a couple steps further. Here's putting a, an underpass in McCaslin at this point, just south of the bridge, tying it into the RTD park and ride, taking it uh, north of Superior Plaza, and taking it down to uh, Cold Creek Trail. So the, this plan has been developed and included in our submittal to, to CDOT. When did, when did that occur? When did that get uh, introduced? Just recently? Yes. That, I mean, I've never seen that. Before. That got introduced when uh, the condition for the bikeway connection to the park and ride uh, was, at, was added. Because uh, we think it uh, makes that connection that much more um, beneficial to have. Because then people can get through under you know through that intersection without having to go through lights or anything they can just take that underpass and stay on the bikeway without any need to stop so this is yeah let me just uh, give you the overall plan this is the plan that uh, the Superior and Louisville developed and, and uh, we discussed with CDOT at the bikeway meeting this afternoon uh, two things are happening here in phase two the bikeway was to to run on the south side and go under the underpass and then come up to Colt Creek, cross under the Colt Creek Bridge at, at US 36, and then along in the triangle section that Seattle owns, along that property up to the castle and cross at the single intersection. This intersection has become more complex with the crossover, so Louisville is actually proposing to take the bikeway and swing it up to uh, Dillon Road and to widen their their uh, trail along Dillon Road through the Dillon McCasson intersection, take it up Dillon Road and then use Dyer to get to the bikeway. So they were proposing that and that came as a result of the uh, diverging diamond uh, interchange. Then as you know they came up with the proposal for putting an underpass just uh, near its Davis and Mason. So we came up with this plan to say, well, why don't you look, if you're going to do that, why don't you look at for building this part of the, uh, the bikeway, uh, whatever savings you have from not building this segment and this segment, after you've built it, do, do any improvements here, take any savings and put along this section here and connect the underpass to the park and ride and then the interchange project will take it from the park and ride under McCaslin and connect it to Cold Creek Trail. So we'll have essentially bikeways on both sides of, of US 36. So we presented this to CDOT and uh, actually there's a bikeway group consisting of all the jurisdictions up and down the corridor and we presented it to them this morning. Uh, the county was, uh, county staff anyway, thought this, this plan was much better than what's in phase two now because you're going through the you know, single ice intersection. So the county liked this plan. And, uh, you know, CDOT, again, they're getting this for the first time and they're trying to react to it. There's another change and how are we going to get all this done and so forth. So that was presented to CDOT today. So what, where's the savings going to be in order to pay for that brown uh, superior connection trail that goes from the underpass to the park and ride? Well, what's in phase two now is a segment here and a segment essentially from here going all the way up. So we're hoping that there's some savings there that they would take any savings and putting on, put it on this side. And see, now, see, I, see, I didn't think this was a big issue. I mean, there's plenty of room out there, but it's moving dirt and building concrete and so forth. So who funds the... Um, the rest of this project if that there is no savings or if it exceeds the savings amount. Well when you say when you say project are you referring to the grade? It's just the superior connection. Just that, that connection from the underpass to the to park, the and, park ride. and ride. That, that was my question is who pays for that? Here. No, no, no from the big star. Uh, David the the little star is the big star. Yeah. Big star from there up to there. Yes. To there. Yeah who pays for that? Who pays we're for asking, that? We're asking CDOT to pay for that. The whole thing. Okay. 
you're saying that's only if there's a savings from switching it over to the other side, correct? Mm -hmm. What if there isn't? I mean, then it either doesn't get constructed or or we, if we want to construct it, but if we're not willing to construct it and see that's what not look, then it doesn't get constructed. But then we still pay for the underpass. No. 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 Oh, okay. That was your condition. Good. But it seems like there would have to be savings because they're not going to be building what they would have built. I mean, all, all that is is a straight sidewalk there, so I mean, it can't be some huge dollar figure, and it seems like that it's got to be close to what they were anticipating putting in anyway. Well, who's paying for the 36 trail there, the blue? Louisville. No, this is, Louisville is asking, this was, this was already in the program. So Louisville is asking that improvements be made along here essentially widening the sidewalk, and then a trail built up here. That wasn't in lieu of the opposite side on, the, on uh, mm -hmm. that? They're, they still want this built, the blue. Okay. So now, if there's any savings between that and what we had before, we'll put it on here. Okay, I understand. Trustee Hanson and Trustee Scamont, sorry, that was your yeah, question. Yeah, okay. Can you go back one graph if you can remember which one that one was? Uh, one map? It was a more of a line drawing version. Okay. So, I, and I apologize because I'm just not a great map reader, I guess. What's the snake in the snaky thing, the switchbacky right. thing? And this is getting back up to the uh, walk system, the pedestrian walk system. That's a sidewalk. It's a sidewalk. Yeah. Right. And I, I question the need for this. That's what I'm asking about. What is uh, that? You know, it's just it's just a connection from here to there. This is lower than, you know, down, we're down under the chasm here, and we have to get up to, because you know, this has gone over the thing. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, a sidewalk. sidewalk. It's a sidewalk. Thank you. Yeah. It's a sidewalk. So, so we have to get. it's a pedestrian. Thank yeah. you. So this is to meet ADA, uh, and that's our initial thing. And, I'm going, well, you could probably start back here to, to get it. So that's the design detail. You know, I just saw this and I commented I on that. Just right. couldn't figure out if that was, you know, it's an ADA ram to get like, from what? down below up, up above. Um, <laughs> it's a tiny thing, but it's a, it's an irksome thing. So um, when you're going across the, Lewis, the Superior Louisville Bridge right now, and you look to the left and you see the pedestrian bridge, you see a huge red arch in the middle of your view of the, of the mountains. And it troubled me when they put it in the first place that it wasn't blue or something more, whatever. I recognize there's some reason to want to have a uniform look, but it seems to me that we're compounding the problem by having yet another arch that's red and it interrupts your view in a big way of the mountains. And it seemed to me that a more blending color would be a better thing. But I Just the to, color or the design? The color. And, and CDOT wouldn't paint the other one red. I mean, blue. They use red steel. Is it red steel? I think so. I don't know. What I hope it's red steel because uh, that actually was one of my uh, questions because the, the red bridge we went under various bridges on the long drive to Kansas this uh, weekend, uh, and most of them turned pink oh, in okay. the heat of the call that a sunshine as they fade. So I'm like, last thing I want over time is three pink railings. So, um, but Lisa, at some of these uh, meetings, I think that you were not able to attend while you were gone, we had some in-depth color uh, uh, discussions. I have a number of observations I'd want, uh, want to share on the, the bridge and the uh, retaining walls and all that. But do we want to finish this part of the topic out before we revert back to bridge issues? Um, if you have questions regarding I, I do have yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, given uh, what sounds like a um, organic process right now for this trail connection from the mm -hmm. Davidson Mesa down to Park and Ride, at what point do we 
or are we planning to throw this back to POSTAC and OSAC, at least have some the chairman sort of uh, voice no opinion about any of that? Do we want to ask their, those opinions? Oh. Because it now seems to have morphed into uh, Well, are we taking public comment right now? Or yeah. Yeah, let's, the, yeah. Doing yeah. Board yeah. yeah, so the answer is. We're still board discussion? Yeah, we're finished well, the board discussion. I'll leave that out there as a yeah. question to be answered. But I did want to point out that I did get a little uh, feedback um, after the last meeting. You'll, you'll remember OSAC, and I believe POSTAC as well, and Jim, you can address this, were first and foremost concerned about the um, coming under at Davidson Mesa and hitting Marshall head on and we are going to possibly create a safety issue there. And you'll recall our resolution in first draft was to require that this be connected both to Superior Trails as well as to the park and ride, and then we, we discussed it more and just stayed with the, that park and ride contingency. But I did want to re-raise the concern that was re-raised to me after our meeting that, in fact, there may well be traffic that crosses, there will be traffic that crosses right over Marshall, and what are we going to do to mitigate any problems with that? So throw it out there. Any other things regarding the trails? Otherwise, go back to the bridge, Trustee Skumas. So, I know that it wasn't held out there as a really great possibility, but uh, a really likely possibility, I should say. I think it was a great possibility, but an unlikely one to have a slip. Yeah. Will the will the trails thing located there be later held up as a problem about why we can't put in a slip ramp? I can't. I mean, I, without more I'm details, sorry. I think. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Without more detail, I don't think we can uh, necessarily we, answer that. If we can convince CDOT to put a slip ramp in at some point in the future, there would just have to be that portion that's impacted. We just have to have included an underpass that would go underneath that slip ramp. Just do that. Okay. Well, I mean, that's what I have to have. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, or loop them around a little bit or something. Okay. All right. So just along the trails, I think it's um, a very good design. I mean, there's going to be some modifications uh, throughout the process uh, of some degree. But we know that the uh, town center planning concept is to have connectivity to the park and ride for transit opportunities for people over there. So I think that the, this adds a significant component, um, especially if the, the trails uh, can go through the Davidson uh, Mesa underpass as well. So I'm generally in favor of all this. Okay. Anything else about trails? Otherwise, the bridge? No, I echo what you're saying. I'm in favor of <coughs> if we get this with our contingency, that, then I'm in favor of it. I was the last time when we discussed it. Uh, if we have issues about where this goes in Superior War to happen, then we, I would think we'd use our normal trails process to see what we want to do about that. If it, this doesn't happen and the underpass happens without our expenditure at all, that's not our issue. And we can still look at what whether we wanted to make a connecting trail, but uh, we can't stop the underpass if somebody wants to pay for it, uh, excluding us. So, so that's your answer to the the possible well, safety I hazard. I don't. First of all, it, there's people riding bikes on Marshall Road now. Mm -hmm. But secondly, if it's a possible safety hazard, I think we need to see whether it's going to happen at all, and then go through our process and see if we want to do something about it trail-wise. I, I, that's kind of my thinking. Just some, some follow-up on that. Um, I would like to make sure we're, we're comfortable with this because we ha our engineers haven't found any major utility conflicts, any major grade issues. Um, we have to figure out how to handle the drainage right in here or suggesting the pipe. I 
I mean, there are some cost implications. That, I mean, this is not cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, so we haven't found any uh, engineering reasons why we can't do this. So we're proceeding, like, trying to get this in, into the project. Uh, I think we built it to here. You know, when the county saw this, then they, they looked at that other map. They, they said, hey, this, uh, this makes a lot of sense here. And this, this segment, I think they would really support. You know, looking at this versus this for the, the actual bikeway, they think this is a, bit, a better plan. So I think the, the county is supportive of that, um, but we didn't. We want to we want to support our neighbors and making sure this this gets built as well. So it could happen that they they build this, we build this, this comes back and you know, this this gets in there, and maybe at some point the county says that makes a whole lot a lot of sense. Let's make that connection. You know, if we can't get seat out to do it right now. Alex, can you go back to that previous slide that you were before? So can you just point with your pointer, where, where's the, um, where you get on the bus? There's the bus right there, okay. Yeah, this, uh, this is a challenge to, you know, make it through uh, because we have great, you know, we have ramps going down and so forth. Uh, we're thinking that to get it through here, there's, there's a, a drop off. This is actually, this is the handicap. I think this is maybe the handicap parking here actual other parking is up there. But to get it from here <laughs> through the R RTD parking ride is not an easy thing, thing to do. So we're working on that. Uh, we think there's there's a, a wide turnaround up there and maybe we use part of that because that was designed for buses to come in and turn around. Well, they aren't really doing that right now. So we, we had some work on getting it through the RTD. Ramp. But this, is, this is where our consultant did it. We've actually taken some designs to go take it a little farther to go through uh, the parking lot. So was it, what, what is the distance from where you would get on a bus there to the chasm there, the underpass? Say About maybe 600 feet or something. I actually, I'd like that. Yes. I mean, once the town center goes in, there's easy access because that's pedestrian and bicycle. So the the other thing that, that we were looking at, and we haven't solved it yet, but this could solve our bus stop problem because. Right now, how do you get people, you know, the bus stop is up around here and they cross at the single. Well, if we can get the bus here, they can, maybe we can get a ramp down here and then they go under and get to the to the parking lot. So we haven't solved that particular issue, but that's another concept that I've been toying around with. Trustee Williams. Okay, so this new pedestrian underpass, is this going to be multi-use path? Yes. So bikes, um, joggers, walkers, skateboarders, they can all use it. The actual opening here is, I think, uh, 18 feet. If you've been over by the new one at Arapahoe and Foothills Parkway. Yes, I have been through that. That's the type of design. Okay. Um, and are we raising the road, or are we completely digging underneath? No, we're... we're Opening up the road and putting a box culvert underneath. We're not raising the road. But the There's road is not being raised. During the DDI construction project, this would go in as a box culvert. Here, here you can see right here. This is this is breaks plus. So you can see the roadways going up. So we're we're about here. Where we, where we take the opening. So so the roadways up. You know, okay. above, and then we're down. Range goes down, so we're, we're right in that area. That's right behind Brakes Plus. And so this is a new connection that we, we did not see the last time we looked at these plans, correct? Yes. And that is going to be what we're going to be funding, Superior. Yes. In one form or another, either through the um, savings that we might have had in uh, interchange district and or the town center or whatever. Do we know how much it's going to cost? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course not. A lot. Uh, a million? Less, than, less than a DDI. <laughs> less than a million? Under 13 million. Oh my goodness. I mean, typical underpasses like this are what, 800 to 800 to, 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 to 1.1 million dollars? Yeah. That's 
I mean, that's what we priced out for that one by the ridge. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's a lot of money, but it's going to be a lot more. If we ever want to do that in the future, it's going to be a lot more money compared to that. Is this something that we had thought about before, or is it? This has been discussed about having some access from town center right. to right, but in that is that's that's what it accomplishes. We've, yeah. we've talked we've talked about this in the past, and the other thing that this could do, what I would like to do, is eliminate the pedestrian crossing of the of the Caslin just north of Marshall, because we can you show me a picture. Yeah. That's the one that throws off all your stoplights. That's right. triple left crossing this crosswalk here mm -hmm. when that gets tripped it causes havoc with our single timing because people because we have to provide all it's like the a time for true time. movement mm -hmm. so I would like to eliminate this and just have people cross this way mm -hmm. and by providing that I have another alternative for them to, to go that way and that, that's coming in the future eliminate that crosswalk and don't wreak havoc with the single timing Okay. Other thoughts regarding trails? Okay. Bridge? Who would like to start? Jesse Bennington? Uh, can you flip back the um, graphic that has the double arches? Mm -hmm. The red double arches there, yeah. Um, it says, um, you know, this, uh, this is. You know, at this point, it becomes so much aesthetic. So, apologies in advance if you're not into aesthetics. Uh, the, it says that a new girder has a gray green color. I'm assuming that color would be the same as, or at least complementary to, the green on the RTD pedestrian bridge. I think it's close to what's out there now. I, I know this is this wall here right. has a green well. Uh, I just want to make sure we're not matching something that's out there now as much as something that is compatible. You know, all along we've we've now gone to compatibility with the RTD pedestrian bridge, and I'd ask that we make sure that green is compatible with that, and that we don't inadvertently sure. select two. I don't don't recall that as gray green. I see it as more of a hunter green mm -hmm. and it won't matter in the execution sure. so I okay. just wanted to have that chain that checked out I'm assuming when we talk about the concrete features having a beige buff sand color that that's an embedded color in the concrete and not painted on yes okay yes. because I painted stuff if you go up to Boulder 28th Street it's just um, awful um, okay and then if you um, my eye goes to the retaining wall, <clears throat> and I'm looking at the retaining wall on the larger picture underneath um, with the two cars on it. <coughs> um, when I look at the, well, when I look at the top picture again, that retaining wall, as I mentioned at last meeting, seemed to be just concrete in color. When I read this, that retaining wall is actually a lighter tone of the retaining wall that's uh, that the abutment that says Louisville on it. Um, do you know which one is in fact the case? <coughs> no. Okay. Uh, what I definitely don't want to happen is that that retaining wall is concrete in color or feel because it destroys the, the, the entire feel of that a bridge because you're in a car so, so you've got to put yourself at car height. I, I know I know right now I, I don't they would probably get a match what's out there now and if you know it's like a greenish color on this wall the one we built. But so you'll see the two depictions are different. It looks more concrete on the top. It looks more um, interesting on the on the lower picture. Um, I think that, are you talking about this wall here? Yes. Because I think that they, they were probably intending on matching the other wall. I mean, this, I don't know which way we're looking, but we have one in place. 
Mm -hmm. Now we're going to build, be building the other one. Right. So uh, I don't think they wanted to touch the one that's there. So they would probably be matching. Okay. Well, that never was uh, part of the discussion. The, we've discussed a lot of these elements, and I, I don't recall in the discussion that they said we're taking as fixed the other side and we're going to match it. Um, you know, my whole point here is we're spending $12, $13 million on this construction. Um, let's not mess it up with a concrete retaining wall, which is, in fact, what cars at street level see. In a matter of fact, I would suggest that that retaining wall actually be stepped, the highest, that the walls actually be stepped back to split the height. And, you know, I paid attention to so many bridges and bridge treatments um, uh, since the, since we started this process, and many of them are actually stepped, so that you don't have all that vertical height. I'm noticing the vertical height, especially on the second, the, the picture below, when you compare it to the height of a car. So, um, um, color and and sheer height, uh, I think will affect a lot of the feel of that bridge, and I'd like to make sure we at least raise that subject. <coughs> That's all for now. Thank you. Other questions or comments? So uh, I, I just, um, well, one minor thing is, maybe it's not minor, but we talked about pedestrian lights. Did, did they pick a pedestrian light style for this, and how many are going in? The lamps. So, like on the uh, bottom right picture, there's, a, I believe, a lamp sort of underneath the red railing, under the red arch. Here? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the type of thing that they uh, come up with based on the direction at those joint meetings. So, is that a, is that a lamp on the second post from the mm -hmm. right? So, how many are there in total? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I actually asked that at last meeting to ask lamp question lamps number of lamps question mark because it wasn't clear. And we, we did all out. specify we want mm -hmm. enough lamps to make it look appealing. And then just in terms of process, so you know, I, I agree with uh, you know importance of the pattern concrete and the color of the concrete it's you know maybe a minor thing but you know it's going to be there for the next 50 years so I want to make sure it's done in the right way so just in terms of process is CDOT then picking who's picking the design of all that CDOT or well what's happening now is that they're putting together an RFP package they've selected three firms to propose on, on that RFP so they're trying to provide as much detail in this RFP to give the design build team enough to go on to give them you know, a price and a design. So a lot of these details, you would go through the design process and establish them. Well, we're giving them about 20% of, of the design, and then the, design, the teams will come back and... and well, the presenter, I mean, it, it's a design build, so theoretically then CDOT is the is the yes. contractor, so the design build person's coming back to see yes. Will they agree to come back to talk to us about our thoughts after that goes through, or is that or are we out of the loop now? Are you talking about cost or design? Design. Design. We're hoping that we get some more shots at this. Okay. Because there's a number of, of design issues that we need to work out, so we're hoping that once the team is, is picked, as they go into the design process, as they further refine the design, that they will come back and and uh, give us a chance to review some of their design details. So, if you're in, in conversation, I'm not sure how it how it's yeah, yeah. So, if you're in conversation though with CDOT, my recommendation is part of the RFP or the or the response uh, to the NRFP would include that they would guarantee to come back for at least one more meeting with. I mean, Louisville apparently doesn't care, so, but I want to make sure that we have another shot at that somehow. Mm -hmm. So, is that something you could ask? Well, I know there's a, package? a list of de de deliverables that, that the contractor has to respond. They have to include these lists, and then there's kind of action items, and so.
contractor provides a set of plans and the CDOT approves it. So I am trying to get plugged into that pr process. Okay. Where, where do we come back so we can have some more input? Right. We, we give the input on 20% design, but we haven't seen the rest right. of the other 80%. So we want to yeah. we want to have another bite at the apple, not not necessarily right. to slow things up or change things, but at least to give you input. Correct. Okay. So I just you know that would be great if that was part of the RFP that the response would have to re the respondents would have to uh, agree to. I guess. Sure. Okay. Trustee Hanson. Uh, question about the upper right corner. I see that it's still just a straight pedestrian path, and I thought that the majority of both boards with Louisville and Superior when we met preferred some type of overlook there. Maybe not as drastic as what was originally presented, but I thought there was going to be some type of overlook that was included. Um, well, uh, that was one of the elements that I think uh, the way I remember was going to be looked at, and, and if there was cost savings so that we can get some other elements then that would mm -hmm. be that. revised so right. we get more of the railing elements. Okay. I think, like, yeah, I, I mean, we had a range of things that were proposed and we had a budget that we we're kind of shooting for. And so that, I think that's one of the casualties of that whole trade-off between the, the aesthetics and the railing and all that and, and getting... Uh, what we thought was matching the uh, comments we heard at the, those joint meetings. So uh, it was a casualty of, of that process. So how much is this project now going to be with all the components that have been added and um, what would our share be? Where, where are we at with all this? Um, we were, I think the interchange with half million was 13.1 was the estimate. Uh, Is that so including the underpass under the capital? No. Okay. And what's this half a million talking about? That was at the last design, meeting. The design, landscape, enhancement. Oh, that was going to... Yeah. Got it. All right. Our portion is 250000 um, I think what we ended up at... Is around four million, approximately four million, uh, with these additional design elements because it was three and a half to begin with for our portion. That the additional, and then there's going to be some administrative costs, but we're still working those details out because this is going to be managed by CDOT. So, um, but we're budgeting for worst case. So, in our agreement with. Louisville, we managed the first phase improvements, and there was a 4% management fee as part of that that Louisville paid to the town spirit to manage the project. The second part of the second phase of improvements, that 4% fee is still there. But that was under the assumption that Louisville was going to manage the project. Now it's going to be managed by CDOT, so there's some discussions that are going ongoing whether we have to pay that 4% or what, how much we would have to pay. And there's the RTD portion, which was estimated about 5.4 million. And as you recall, we've had this discussion about the Q jumps and kind of putting those Q jumps, taking, you know, putting those on hold or eliminating the ones in the castle and, and using the, uh, some of the money from that to this project. And as you recall, the, we talked about um, Phase one, the phase one contractor giving us a change order for doing the key jumps at, in Westminster. And so they did come back with a change order about $1.2, $1.3 million. And RTD had $5 million for the key jumps. So we were talking about taking the balance, 3.7, and putting it into phase two, which could conceivably cover RTD's portion. Plus we have the $15 million that Trustee Williams was talking about some of that would also be part of the bank. You mean Wednesday's meeting for the fifteen million for phase two of US thirty six corridor would part of that fifteen million would would go towards this project? Yeah, I think so, yes. Should be for transit improvements. Yeah. yeah for the transit. Specifically? I mean, the goal of the U.S. 36 Mayors and Commission, no, not specifically, but the, 
is to raise enough money that um, that there would be from the toll revenue off of the managed lanes that there would be significant transit improvements of some form or the other. So it's really, I mean, could they could the uh, concessionaire potentially fund this without it? Maybe, but it's really important to raise that money so that some of those uh, dollars could be spent for transit, which obviously this would mm -hmm. apply. So the RTD's portion, that is the 5.4 million um, that we are committing to build so that RTD service would be Better more than beneficial than it is today. Um, is is that going to be funded fully or not? It doesn't sound like it. Well, I know we talked about taking the balance of the QJump project, and that's about 3.7, it appears. Where the other 1.7 comes from. Yeah, HPT has talked about that's the highway public transit enterprise mm -hmm. high performance it's, it's yeah, high performance, performance transportation enterprise uh, yeah they in our meeting with them they talked about um, possibly being able to uh, fund that difference and then uh, through a, an agreement with RTD we pay back over a certain number of years or um, but they had had indicated a willingness to look at, at that as a possibility for any shortage so and in addition to, sorry to cut you off, uh, going for future uh, Dr. Tom, Dr. Cobb dollars starting next year. Right. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so we don't really know what our portion is going to be at this point. It's uh, with the underpass that we talked about, which would be the connection for, it's going to be, um, well, worst case would be three and a half to five million. You're talking about the underpass under McCaslin, not the one. Okay. No, you know. So this entire project is going to be somewhere between three and a half and five. Superior. Okay. For, for superior. Right. For superior. Right. Okay. Thank you. And in our interchange account, we have sufficient funds to cover that. Okay. Other bridge topics? So, just for the record, as people know, but I have to say it again, I hate spending money on a decorative arch when that money could be saved or used for something else. So, my perspective, I'd get rid of the arch. But I'm not willing to hold up a project or die on my, fall on my sword for an arch. So, understanding that that has been the desire of the vast majority of our board as well as Louisville City Council. I guess I can live with that. How much does it cost? Five hundred thousand. So Louisville already yeah. signed off on it. Well and so Uh, public comment regarding this particular issue, any or all of the trails, bridge, colors, flowers, anything? <laughs> Chris, Jim Payne, a Superior Resident, Chair of ProStack. I just wanted to, to, to address uh, Trustee Pennington's point, which I appreciate her bringing up. Um, when ProStack, and I, I'm not speaking for OSAC, but I attended the meetings and I know their resolution, so I think we were in largely in concert on this. When we were asked to, uh, both committees were asked to look at this, we were really looking at the soft trail, I'll call it the soft trail connection, because it has been our assumption that um, what's driving this, uh, now I'm talking about the underpass at Davidson Mesa, what's driving that from Lewis's, Louisville's perspective is connecting with that whole trail network um, that goes to the west. And it's not just um, bikes or cycle, cycle because when you met Trustee Sorelli, when you mentioned, well, there are already bikes on, on Marshall. Well, we anticipate a lot of bike and, and, and hiking traffic moving into that trail system. So then we had that discussion and there was some comment in the session with the board. Then the board moved in the direction of the bikeway, which we haven't 
addressed, have, haven't been asked to, and I personally think that that's great, and that ProStack and I would expect OSAC would be highly supportive of, of that hard trail bike connection. But, uh, and now you've added, added a third element, which also sounds great to me, but the, the committees haven't looked at this, of the underpass um, under McCaslin. But we're concerned, and we're concerned coming out of that last meeting, that you then turned away and had not really addressed the issue of the uh, soft trail connections. And our concern is that, um, and I can say this because it was discussed after the meeting, is that um, it's a very different thing from what you're addressing with the bikeway. So uh, to sum it up, Louisville, a lot of the direction here is going to be north to south. Louisville, um, this trail connection wants to connect with ours. And that's going to just dump people out on a very critical bend in a, in a already dangerous and road with already has a lot of bikes, people crossing. And if that's not, it's going to have to be addressed soon, so someone's going to have to pay for it. I understand it's not superior land, but um, that, was our, that was our thought, and that's the concern uh, after that conversation. But, so it's certainly not uh, in any way um, at all negative about the direction you're going with the bikeway. I predict ProStack and OSAC will be equally supportive of that. We just want to see that connection, what I'll call the soft trail connection addressed. Great, thanks. I'm Ray Bagley on Eldorado Drive. Maybe if I switch the uh, Um, I haven't been following the whole project too closely, so I'll just leave this as a, as a comment. I sort of cycles a lot in this area um, and try to get my kids to take up cycling more. If I had to pick an underpass, I would choose that one. You know, if, I could, if we could only have one going north-south, I would definitely choose that one because like, my kids want to ride up to Lamar's to get a donut on the weekend, and we now have to take the elevator on the RTD bridge. And back down, and you know, getting uh, three people with bikes in the elevator is a bit of a challenge, especially when they're ten. <laughs> and so I'm not sure you know, what all is driving the request for this. I said I've been following the process, but you know, really getting some better north-south access I think would be critical in the interchange redesign because it's pretty far out of the way to come here, mm -hmm. and then still the traffic to manage along Dillon. Um, you, you know, many driveways, many intersections. Uh, ride it with a kid someday, it's really not very friendly. So anything that lets us get north into Louisville easier, I think, would be a much needed improvement. Great, thank you. Part, part of what's driving, well, Louisville's interest on the Davidson Mesa basically is driving that particular location. Some of it has to do with just topography. Um, they have a lateral extension of their water supply through there, so there's actually some under there's some underpass there already, so I think that's part of it. And the other areas are don't have the the ability, I think, from topograph from a topographical perspective to get north and south. So, so is there some plan of where the bicycle traffic goes, or to non-vehicle traffic goes once it comes south under there? Does everyone just get on Marshall Road then to get over to 66? It depends on where they're going. So the US 36 uh, bike connect, bike trail connection, basically, you know, goes to Denver essentially. So and this it would cross at the the Green Star there on the other side and goes to Boulder. Uh, oh, so that's that. the, the planned bikeway. Yes. Okay. Right, and this that we're trying to coordinate with that. So that's what this is. And the Middle Star, that's not an. A proposed underpass. Yeah, no, that's. Oh, it's not. No, that's the, that's right. that's the existing. Oh, that's no, that's what that's your. Okay. That is the RTD bridge. Then you would have to go instead underneath the green where the purple yeah. is. Where the, that's the existing underpass on the Coal Creek Trail, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So to and connect to that existing uh, Coal Creek Trail. Okay. So. So still not much improvement on the north south. Gotcha. Not if you're trying to get right to the businesses mm -hmm. by the interchange. No, you're exactly right. It's uh, it's limited improvement for sure. If you want to get to the donuts, you're gonna have problems. Still a long ride to the donut shop. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
You're going to have to work hard for those down there. I, I keep telling them. <laughs> Follow a police car. <laughs> Thank you. Additional public comment regarding this? So, seeing on process, so this is out to, uh, out to C dot and the RFP, and they're expecting a response back in September. Does that sound right? The, the current, they're hoping to uh, get the final RFP out uh, by October 1st to the design build teams. Okay. Uh, and then hope to get, have uh, responses back in the fall and hope to select the design build team by January of uh, next year. Okay. And uh, I just want to make sure I'm on track with the underpass that I keep going on that and move forward. Those, those have been submitted, so we're trying to get that into the RFP at this point. I don't, I'll be getting cost estimates of that, you know, fairly soon, but uh, again, you're on the your purple underpass. Point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and the green one is, it's already been submitted and that's part of the RFP package. Already. And we're already in for a quarter of that cost, correct? No. If, if, the, connection, if the connection works. With if, caveat. If CDOT agrees to build the bikeway on the south side of the highway to our parking ride, then, then they will fund it. To, uh, 25%. They will. We will. We will. Okay. We'll commit to the 25% for the underpass, right. but they'll build the connection to our park and ride. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I did say that, but then everybody said no. <laughs> all right. I think we're all on the same uh, page. We're all on the same page. Right, yeah. It's just semantics here. Yep. Jesse Skumatz. And um, I didn't understand that the arches weren't um, supporting, so I guess if, if I had my brothers, I'd rather have no arches to because of my whole view thing. Uh, that, that's exactly my perspective, but I can tell you that we are in the minority here. I'm used to it. So, yeah, glued on arches for aesthetics purposes yeah. uh, don't make much sense to me, but call me crazy. All right, um, I think that is done for this topic. Anything, we don't need any action for this evening, right? Okay, all right, thanks. Um, with that, it brings us to item number 10, uh, which is executive session to determine positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, develop a strategy for negotiations and or instruct negotiators pursuant to CRS 24-6-42, print 4, print E. Um, and a topic Thank is not being provided away. because it Thank would you. potentially compromise the purpose of the executive session and to consider purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of real, personal, or other property pursuant to CRS 24-6-42, print 4, print E, print A. With that, I'll entertain a motion by Trustee Skumat, second by Trustee Williams, all in favor. Uh, can I have a quick yes. question? Yes, um, discussion, I should have said. Yeah, I'm sorry, thank you. 